Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, today's topic for uh, our program, Jesus or Muhammad, the pagan origins of Islam. We know that the Arabian Peninsula, long time ago in the history, there was some Jews are living there and Christians and Arabian that are worshipping uh, idols in those uh, times. And there were a lot of heretics going on, even among the Christian community in that area. So it will be an interesting, uh, interesting topic tonight to discuss the pagan origins of Islam. So stay with us and uh, the phones will be open as soon as we uh, speak a little bit about our topic tonight and then we'll open the phone lines uh, 248-416-1300. Uh, how are you David today? I'm good. How are you Sam? Uh, praise the Lord Jesus okay. Christ and the love of Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's an interesting topic today so uh, who is going to start to lay the foundation for our subject today? Uh, I'll, I'll, you you all right. Say okay. all right. Yeah. Go ahead. Praise the Jesus Christ our Lord may be glorified. This is an uh, interesting topic for me because um, one of the most common criticisms we hear from Muslims is that Christianity has been corrupted and that Christianity has been influenced by paganism and that Christian beliefs uh, have been, uh, when, when Muslims say that Christianity was corrupted, so Jesus was given a message and then later on people corrupted it, they often say that it was corrupted by paganism. So the pagans, the various Greeks and their beliefs influenced Christianity. Now this is absolute nonsense. The Christians were horribly persecuted for centuries because they refused to compromise in any way with paganism. And all the beliefs that you can point to Christianity and say, aha, you got that from paganism, actually those beliefs are prophesied in the Old Testament. So there's no way these things came from paganism. But what's more interesting about this is that when we examine Islam, it's Islam that has been incredibly influenced by paganism, and Muslims don't even realize it. Muslims think that when they bow down towards the Kaaba, that they're doing something that is thoroughly Islamic. No, you're not. That was a pagan temple before it was anything. It had anything to do with monotheism. Uh, when Muslims uh, fast during the month of Ramadan, or take the pilgrimage to Mecca, or kiss the black stone, they're thinking that they're doing something uh, monotheistic and Islamic. No, these are all pagan practices. And what we find, if we examine the evidence objectively, is that pretty much everything, pretty much everything that was a part of 7th century culture has been incorporated into Islam, but these, this, was, this was a pagan world. I mean, just, just, uh, just to give you an example here, uh, think of, let's say, 15th century Japan, 15th century Japanese culture, the way they dressed, uh, the way they talked, the way they acted. Uh, now suppose people in 15th century Japanese culture came to believe that a prophet arose among them and these uh, Japanese uh, religious believers went out spreading their religion and they tried to spread uh, 15th century Japanese culture wherever they went. So everyone had to wear Japanese robes and everyone had to speak Japanese and you had to read the holy book in Japanese. Japanese was the holy language of God. Uh, what would you think? Would, would, this not be, would this not be absurd? And yet that's exactly what we find in Islam. It's 7th century Arabian culture, 7th, uh, 7th century Arabian practices, most of them pagan practices, and this has been incorporated into the very fabric of Islam. And we just want you Muslims to realize where these practices come from. When you bow down to that Kaaba, we want you to know that was a pagan practice. Every time you bow down and face Mecca, we want you to understand that was a pagan practice. That's what the pagan polytheists of Mecca did. When you take the pilgrimage, when you go on the Hajj, when you kiss the black stone, when you walk around the Kaaba, seven these were pagan practices. How can this not bother you? And then how can you be so hypocritical and point to Christianity and say, Christianity was influenced by paganism, when it, it hasn't been in any way. So this is what we want to lay out today, but don't take our word for it when we say that Islam has been influenced by paganism. We'll show you from your own sources. We'll show you from history that Islam has been influenced by paganism. So, Sam, you want to uh, give them some yeah. Do we have evidence? time or do we have a call? Yeah. Yeah. No. All right. We well, we'll set okay. We just want to let the people understand what we're yeah, the trying topic to do about tonight. tonight. Yes. Um, uh, people who've been watching the sh uh, show know it's my habit just to invoke uh, the God and Father of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that the Father of the Lord Jesus will just clothe us with his love, with his presence, with his Holy Spirit. And I pray that for all of us. And I pray in Jesus' name that the Father enables us to speak the truth clearly and passionately without compromise 
but to do it in a spirit of love. His love for the Muslims flowing through us so that Muslims will know, although that we're discussing tough issues, our intention is not to attack you or to degrade you or humiliate you or debase you. That's what the Quran commands you to do to us. The reason why we are criticizing Islam uh, is because we love you enough that we want you to know the truth so that you can fall in love with Jesus Christ. Come to know Jesus and be washed in His blood and born of His Spirit, the Spirit of His Father, so that you can receive eternal life as a free gift because of what Jesus did. And I pray that the Lord Jesus, the Son of God, will enable us to accomplish that uh, task, glorifying Him and winning Muslims uh, for His Lordship, I pray in Jesus' name. With that said, uh, <clears throat> I just want to read some narratives, uh, traditions attributed to Muhammad, traditions that are deemed to be authentic uh, without dispute. Uh, Brother David said that the Kaaba is a pagan shrine. <clears throat> it's a, a pagan temple. In fact, the Hadiths say that during the lifetime of Muhammad, there were at least 360 idols <clears throat> that were found in this pagan shrine. 360 idols of the pagans that worshipped at, at the shrine in honor of these gods. Now let me read the narration. This comes from Sahil Bukhari. Sahil Bukhari deemed to be the most authentic collection of narrations beyond any dispute. Uh, volume 6, <clears throat> Book 60, number 244. Now Muslims, please pay attention to what I'm about to read and the implications that I'm going to draw from these narratives. Narrated Abdullah ibn Masood, Volume 6, Book 60, Number 244. Narrated Abdullah ibn Masood, Allah's Apostle entered Mecca in the year of conquest, the year he conquered Mecca, and there were 360 idols around the Kaaba. Here it says around the Kaaba, the pagan shrine. He then started hitting them with a stick in his hand and said, Truth, i.e. Islam, has come, and falsehood, disbelief, has vanished, meaning the falsehood of paganism. As we will see, Islam retains much of its, uh, uh, much of the pagan practices of those who were living there before the time of Muhammad and during his time. Truly falsehood is ever bound to vanish. Truth has come and falsehood cannot create anything. So according to this narration, when Muhammad conquered Mecca, there were at least 360 idols surrounding the Kaaba. Now why is that significant? <clears throat> that means prior to the time Prior to that moment when Muhammad eradicated these idols, Muhammad was steeped in paganism. Remember, according to Muslim sources, uh, he belonged to the Quraysh tribe. The Quraysh tribe were pagans, even admitted by Muslim sources, and they worshipped these 360 idols. And what's interesting is that according to the sources, when Muhammad supposedly received revelation from Jibreel, Gabriel, this took place during the month of Ramadan. According to Sal Bukhari, volume 1, number 3, Muhammad, it was his custom that during the month of Ramadan, would go to the higher caves, the higher mountains in, in, in Arabia, and he would meditate. And during this time of meditation and contemplation, the spirit came, and the spirit later identified himself as G uh, Gabriel. Now, why is, that, uh, why is that important? Because that tells you that even the fasting month of Ramadan was something being observed by the Arabs long before Muhammad claimed to be a prophet. So I want the Muslims to understand the implication of these statements and these sources. Muhammad, before he claimed to be a prophet, was observing the month of Ramadan. In fact, it was during this month that Gabriel supposedly came to, uh, to Muhammad. So the fast of Ramadan was a pagan fast. According to these sources, there were pagan idols, idols erected by the pagans uh, around the Kaaba. And according to one source specifically, Muhammad would run around the Kaaba as these 360 idols were around it. Let me read the source. This comes from Sirat Rasulullah. Sirat Rasulullah, and it's available in English, translated by er Alfred Goleme. I, it's a French, how do you pronounce the last? Guillaume. Guillaume, all right. French last French. name, man, I don't know. It's spelled Goleme, but he says Guillaume. All right, Alfred Guillaume translated Sirat Rasulullah. It's the oldest extant biography on the life of Muhammad which was edited by Ibn Hisham. It was written down by Ibn Ishaq, edited by Ibn Hisham, translated in English by Alfred Guillaume. This comes from the English translation, Life of Muhammad, page 170. Now let me read this quotation. When the Apostle of God had finished his period of seclusion, when he would go to the higher caves and meditate during the, the month of Ramadan, the fasting month that Muslims till this day observe, he returned to Mecca. 
In the first place, he performed the, the circum, uh, circumambulation of the Kaaba, the running around the Kaaba that the Muslims do till this day when they perform Hajj or Umrah, as was his wont, meaning his practice. While he was doing it, Waraka met him and said, O oh, son of my brother, tell me what thou hast seen and heard. Notice what this is saying, that after his encounter with the spirit who identified himself as Gabriel, Muhammad returned to, to Mecca, ran around the Kaaba during the time in which there were still 360 idols. Now, why would the prophet of monotheism, the prophet who supposedly brought the strictest form of monotheism known, why would he observe the practice of running around the Kaaba when it was littered with idols, 360 to be exact? And we'll find that later on, when he went to Medina, he did it again. When he performed Umrah, he again ran around the Kaaba when the idols were still in place. Why is he observing such practices when this house is littered with idols, an abomination to the true God? Now, before I move on to my next point, do we... I have a question for okay. you guys. Okay, excuse me. Uh, it been said when Islam came, they cleaned the Kaaba from all of these uh, idols that was inside. That's what I just read, yes. <clears throat> all right. And uh, the other one, from where this black stone came, it's a meteorite or it really came from heaven for Abraham to build a temple on it there. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. Um, as far as the, yes. the uh, cleansing of the Kaaba, uh, yes, Muhammad smashed the, uh, the idols that were there with the exception. And Jesus was there too. <laughs> oh, you mean the picture? I the know picture. Yeah. He's talking about a portrait of Jesus yeah. and Abraham. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, as far as the cleansing of the temple, though, it's, it's, very, uh, it's very important to recognize that uh, originally Muslims prayed facing Jerusalem. Uh, but Muhammad would visit the Kaaba. Muhammad would visit the Kaaba regularly, even as a Muslim, when, it, when he was a persecuted prophet in Mecca. So Muhammad is in Mecca. He has no control. There are still the 360 idols there. Muhammad visits this pagan shrine regularly and kisses the black stone. Interestingly, later on, when the Jews rejected Muhammad and they understood the Torah enough to realize that he's a false prophet, uh, Muhammad turned away from Jerusalem as, uh, as the direction that Muslims should pray to and turned facing the Kaaba in Mecca. So for several years, for several years before Muslims conquer, before Muslims conquer Mecca and destroy the idols, Muslims are bowing down and facing a house of worship that is filled with 360 pagan idols. Now, just imagine this. The, the prophet of monotheism comes along and says, you want to know where we're going to pray to? We're going to pray facing those 360 pagan idols. Why would you do that? Because that was what the pagans did. That's what Muhammad had been raised to do. That's what the vast majority of his followers had been raised to do. They had been raised to bow down to these 360 idols. And they were very comfortable doing this. This seemed natural to them. Abu Bakr, all of the early, uh, all of the early uh, Muslim converts from Mecca uh, would have grown up bowing down to this pagan temple. And that's exactly what, what Muhammad did for a period of several years. While it, was still, while it was still surrounded with pagan idols, Muslims are bowing down to it. Now, as far as, uh, as, far as the black stone, yes, this does seem to be some sort of meteorite. It's, it's interesting to note that other places around the world, when, when, when a meteorite would fall to earth, they would take this up as an object of veneration and worship. In ancient Ephesus, in ancient, Ephes in ancient Ephesus they were known to have a meteorite. They were known to have a meteorite, uh, mm -hmm. which, was, which became an object of reverence and worship. I'm sure Sam can go into uh, more detail on, on actual sources on what <clears throat> we read about the Black Stone. Uh, but there's no question. There, Muslims, what are you doing? You're going to smash every idol except for this black stone, which was this, was, this was a pagan object. This is what the pagan, this fell from heaven for us. That's what the pagans believed. Other pagan groups in the ancient world believed the same thing about it. And interestingly enough, even the early Muslims recognized that there was something very, very wrong about this. Umar, the second rightly guided caliph, said to the black stone, he said, I, you can't do anything. If, I would never, ever, 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 ever kiss this black stone, this object of paganism, but for the fact that I saw Muhammad doing it. So early Muslims, even the rightly guided, one of the rightly guided caliphs recognize this object is associated with paganism. There's no way I'm going to go over there and kiss it the way the pagans are doing it. I'm not going to adopt this pagan practice 
But I have to, because according to Surah 3321, Muhammad is the example that all Muslims should follow. Therefore, if Muhammad is kissing this uh, object of pagan idolatry, just the way the pagans were doing, then I'm going to do it too. And Muslims to this day, when they, when they, when they visit Mecca, will do everything, everything they can to get close enough to the black stone to kiss it. Why? Because Muhammad did. Why did Muhammad do it? Because he grew up in the Quraysh tribe, and that was what they did. That's what the pagans of Mecca did. This seemed very natural to them, and now it's a part of Islam. So, again, what you, Muslims, what, what do you do? What do you do when you're pointing a finger at Christianity saying it's been corrupted by paganism, and it hasn't, and yet when we turn to your religion, we look at almost every single practice you have. Almost every single practice in your religion comes directly from the pagans. How can this not bother you? How, how can this not bother you? If I had a practice that was part of my religion, and I immediately saw, oh, wait a minute, this was a pagan practice that was adopted by someone in my religion, I would be horrified. I would be horrified. And in Islam, it's not just one, it's not two, it's not three, it's not four, it's not five. It's almost everything you do as part of your religion was a pagan practice or a pagan belief. How can this not bother you? I don't know. Okay, uh, I have another uh, question. It could be a kind of compromise with Muhammad and the tribe of Quraysh to make that reconciliation that they kept the Kaaba and if there is anything has to do with the moon or the crescent that there was people are worshiping that uh, god of the moon or those eras. And uh, before I get into the moon, uh, the moon god, whether Allah was a moon god, mm. uh, I just want to understand your question. Are you asking that Muhammad compromise with them? No, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, is what he's asking? Yeah. Because he made a uh, reconciliation with his tribe when he came back and they yeah, had when he conquered this big them? sheet and they uh, tried to uh, maybe he said, okay, I'm going to keep this Kaaba, but let's clean it up and yeah, I, I don't think clean it's it for the new God. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't. I don't think he did mm -hmm. it because he was trying to compromise with oh, them. Oh man, I got well, we're, we're gonna have a debate on screen here. Uh, I, well, no, because if you let me finish my okay, point, okay. All right. uh, I, I thought you were on my side, but oh, you see, no, this is what happens this. when it's life. Okay. Uh, what, uh, because he had them under his control, he had already subjugated them. So if the purpose was to compromise, to appease them, mm -hmm. well, at this point in time, he has the power and he subjugated them, and they're under his control. Mm -hmm. I, I actually think it's because uh, uh, he grew up steeped in these practices and that he, he adopted as part of his religion. So I, I'm sure Dave's going to say that to compromise and to bring them in union with him, but he had already controlled them, subjugated them, and dominated them at the point that you're talking about. Because you're mm -hmm. saying when he came and he wanted to appease them. Well, even before, before that, he's already observing these practices. And the reason why I say it's significant for this so-called prophet of monotheism for him to be running around the Kaaba at a time in which there are three, three, uh, still 360 idols is that there's a, s a tradition. Now, I don't believe this tradition is true historically, but it's reported in the Muslim sources. The same Ibn Ishaq reports that the Jews were telling the king of mm -hmm. uh, the Yemeni king, the mm -hmm. king of the Yemenites, that <coughs> this Kaaba supposedly was erected by their father Abraham. Now, I don't believe this episode happened. Be that as it may, it's recorded in this, this source that Muslims believe uh, contains reliable tradition. Not mm -hmm. completely reliable, they'll question some of the traditions, but I want to read the part that's significant in showing that the Jews, uh, if this is a true report, that the Jews more more conscious of the worship of the one God than Muhammad himself, and here's why. I'm just going to read it so you mm -hmm. can see why it's so significant that what Muhammad did was a violation of monotheism, because Muslims keep saying that Islam is the purest form of monotheism and worship sh should, be, uh, should be given to Allah alone. You shouldn't mix it with paganism. But let's see what the Jews told, or supposedly told, the Yemeni king. Let me read this. This comes from the life of Muhammad, translation of Sirat Rasulullah. And in the English translation, it's pages 8 to 9. It says, they, the rabbis, uh, uh, told that the sole object of the tribe was to destroy him and his army, talking about the tribe in, in Mecca. We know of no other temple in the land, this is the Jews supposedly saying this, which God has chosen for himself, uh, that's said they, and if you do what they suggest, you and all your men will perish. The king asked them what he should do when he got there, and they told him to do what the people of Mecca did, Circam uh, circumambulate the temple, run around the temple, to venerate and honor it, to shave his head, and to behave with all humility until he had left its precincts. Then the king asked, and a very smart uh, question, by the way. The king asked why they didn't do likewise. Okay, the Jews are telling the king, when you get to Mecca, don't destroy it. Run around the Kaaba, you know, honor its customs, because this is a house of God, supposedly. So then the king asked these Jews, okay, then why don't you do it? If you believe this is the house of God, 
It was erected by your father Abraham. How come you don't go there and honor the customs and run around it? Now notice the response given by the Jews. They replied that it was indeed the temple of their father Abraham. But the idols which the inhabitants had set up around it and the blood which they shed there presented an insuperable obstacle. They are unclean polytheists, they said, or words to that effect. The Jews refused to run around the Kaaba because there were idols still at the Kaaba at this time. And yet I just read a tradition that said Muhammad ran around the Kaaba when there were still 360 idols around it. So how can you say that Muhammad brought the purest form of monotheism when we see that early in his career he had no reticence running around the Kaaba littered with idols. So again, and then maybe Dave, you want to comment on what he was yes, saying, on, his question. Uh, I wanted to comment on the, the compromise. Actually, Sam and I aren't, aren't too much in disagreement. We're thinking of compromise in two different senses. Right. Uh, Sam was thinking of compromise as, uh, hey, I want to make a compromise with these guys to, to end this dispute between us. I was thinking of, of compromise just in the sense that uh, Muhammad had a desire, a deep down desire, uh, to win these people over, and that this influenced the revelations yeah. that he was, uh, that he was, uh, he believed he was receiving from God. Because we know, if we know anything about Muhammad, we know that he was influenced by his desires. When he wanted more than four wives, he got a revelation saying it could have more than four wives. When he wanted to s uh, sleep with his slave girl, and he gave an oath to his wives saying that he wouldn't sleep with his slave girl, he got a revelation from God telling him, "Go ahead, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can violate this oath." To your own wives. When uh, Muhammad wanted the wife of his own adopted son, he got a revelation saying, okay, you can have her. Over and over and over again, Muhammad had a desire, and then this desire would be satisfied by a revelation. And in the next program, we're going to be talking about something uh, uh, that's even more closely related with the satanic verses. The entire uh, uh, the, the source of the satanic verses is that Muhammad desired that the pagans of Mecca, specifically the Quraysh, would join his religion, would submit to Islam. And he longed for a revelation from God that would bring these people to Islam. And then he got the revelation that would do this. It was a revelation promoting, promoting the gods of, uh, of, of the pagans, Allah, Alus, and Manat. So Muhammad desired reconciliation with his people so much that it affected the revelations he was getting. So later on, when Muhammad is praying towards Jerusalem, and this is offending his uh, pagan kinsmen, uh, it's not difficult to see how this person who wants reconciliation with these pagan kinsmen who are offended that he's praying towards Jerusalem would say, oh, actually, no, God has changed the direction of prayer, and now we are to pray facing the Kaaba, just like all you pagans whom I was offending by facing Jerusalem. So it's not that Muhammad sits down and says, all right, what can I do uh, what can I do here? How can I, how can I make things right between us and how can I make this less difficult for them? It's that Muhammad has a desire for reconciliation with them and Muhammad's desires, as we know from all the Muslim sources, Muhammad's desires often, often uh, uh, influence his revelations. And if that offends you, if you think I'm wrong, uh, I would just invite you to, uh, to, to trust Aisha. If you don't trust me, surely if you're at least a Sunni Muslim, you would trust Aisha, the source of so many narrations about Muhammad, who said, after Muhammad received one of these revelations that satisfied his desires, uh, Aisha said, My, your Lord hastens to satisfy your wishes and desires. Aisha noticed this over a period of years, that every time Muhammad wants something, a revelation comes down saying, Oh, of course you can have that, Muhammad. Uh, you, want, you want the wife of your own adopted son? No problem. You get her. Uh, you want more wives than, than you told everyone else they're allowed to have? No problem. You, you get them. Anything you want, Muhammad, you get. And when we, when we understand that Muhammad's, uh, according to Aisha, not according to me, according to Aisha, uh, Muhammad's revelations were influenced by his desires. Uh, and when we understand that, and we understand that Muhammad had a desire to reconcile with the pagans of Mecca and to bring them uh, into Islam, it's certainly not surprising that he would adopt all the practices of Islam and that these would all get Allah's stamp of approval. After all, Allah put his stamp of approval on all of Muhammad's desires. All right, I uh, have another question for you guys till we get the phone calls right. working here. Uh, Christianity, we would like to be connected to Abraham. Mm -hmm. yes. The Judaism, we are the sons of Abraham. And Islam says, yes, also we are the sons of Abraham. Yes. And uh, is there is any documentary that says that Abraham <clears throat> went to the Arabian Peninsula and this was the place that God told him to, to build a temple for his son there in that area, the Kaaba area? 
No. The short no. answer is no. No, 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 no not, not no a shred. pre-Islamic evidence. No, right. none whatsoever. If you yeah, uh, and and you know th this is this is something that that's very interesting. According to uh, according to what Muslims believe and what Muslims tell us, uh, you know, there was a line of descendants from Ishmael. You know, it's, it's just like the descendants of 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 uh, through through Isaac that that ultimately became the Jews. And 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 think about think about this though. The Jews are there. They're in a community. They refuse. Uh, to compromise with paganism. Whenever they do compromise with paganism, God punishes them right. until they come back immediately to belief in the one true God. God is always in a clear relationship with the Jews, and ultimately the Messiah comes, uh, comes to the Jews. So there's always a link. They have the genealogies. They can always trace who's related to whom, who goes back uh, to Abraham, and so on. Uh, Muslims don't have a shred of evidence, don't have a shred of evidence that Muhammad's connected with, uh, with uh, Ishmael. They don't have any genealogies. They don't have any evidence that they're related to Abraham. They have none of this. So why is that? Why is it that, that the Jewish community that comes through Isaac kept careful records of everything, was very careful uh, to document their genealogies, knew who was related to who, uh, so that they could trace the lineage of Jesus, they could trace the lineage of, of all kinds of people, of David, of everyone, and we get to Islam, and you show me, show me a genealogy of Muhammad that goes back to I Ishmael. You have no evidence. It's, what, what we find in Islam is Muhammad takes all these pagan practices and says, oh, Abraham did it, and I'm, I'm a descendant of Abraham. Well, do you have any evidence for that? Well, I'm a prophet. Uh, well, and anything else, Muhammad? Because that's what we're wondering. We're wondering if you're a prophet. And based on what you're telling us, everything you seem to be adopting, uh, as far as your practices are, are concerned, is a pagan practice. So you can't just say, well, Abraham... Again, again, imagine this. Imagine you, you came to some, you came to some uh, culture. Let's, let's, again, let's say 15th century Japanese culture. And in 15th century Japanese culture, a prophet arises and says, I'm, I'm a true prophet. And you, you say, why are you, why are you f trying to get everyone to agree with, with you and say that, that 15th century Japanese culture is the culture that everyone else has to adopt? Uh, well, I'm a descendant of Abraham. You got any evidence for it? No, I don't have any evidence, but I'm a prophet. Well, yeah, if we, uh, if we believe you're a prophet, then we would have to say, okay, we have to believe what you say. But if your prophethood is in question, if that's what we're trying to figure out, then you saying you're a descendant of Abraham and yet having all these pagan practices... Uh, that weighs against you. So the only evidence we have right now, until Muslims show good proof that Muhammad was a prophet of God, all the evidence we have is against him because the only thing we know about these practices historically is that they were pagan practices. So until Muslims come up with clear proof that they go back to Abraham, we can only assume that these are pagan practices and that therefore Muhammad was not a true prophet because a true prophet is not going to compromise with the pagan practices of, uh, of, of uh, polytheistic Mecca. All right. I just want to, uh, would you have a call? No, oh, I have another so. comment. Before you ask a question, <laughs> I just want to add what Brother David said. As far as Christians are concerned, even Jews who are committed to the authority of the scriptures, uh, we cannot accept Muhammad is a son of Ishmael because of the following reason. Uh, according to the Islamic sources, specifically... This was my, going to be my uh, uh, next... <laughs> what, what was it going to be? Uh, Abraham is Chaldean. Hagar, the son of uh, the mother of Ishmael, is Egyptian. So there is any Arabic blood there. <laughs> well, uh, Muslims say that Ishmael wasn't a native Arab. He uh, became, uh, he spoke Arabic. So that opens another can of worms, especially right. if he said he's Chaldean. But his I don't want to get is, into. Uh, tomb is southern Israel. Um, like a little bit of northern Saudi Arabia. Well, Abraham? He was, uh, Ishmael do, uh, himself, Ishmael? When he was buried, yes. Okay, well, I didn't know that. But uh, <laughs> he's got new archaeological discoveries. No, that's the uh, Praise the Lord for this guy. Isn't he amazing? <laughs> Let me come back to the point where we can be certain. I don't want to go into areas where we're not certain, and I don't want to debate issues that are gray. I want to deal with black and white. Uh, according to the scriptures, if you go to Genesis 21, 21, it says that Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran. Mm -hmm. Genesis 21, 21 clearly tells us where Ishmael settled. If you get any good Bible map, you'll note that the wilderness of Paran is located around Egypt and sure, around mm -hmm. Israel. Mm -hmm. It's not in Mecca. That's clear. Just get any Bible map, you'll see that. Not only that, Genesis 21, 21 goes on to say that Hagar, his mother, went and got Ishmael an Egyptian bride. She went to Egypt and got him a wife. Now, if we follow the reasoning of the Muslims that connect Muhammad to Ishmael, uh, according to their sources, Ishmael himself and his mother settled in Mecca. Once in Mecca, 
Ishmael married a woman from the tribe of Jurhum. And by the way, this is not found in the Quran. The Quran says nothing about this. This is found in the Hadith literature, specifically Sahih al-Bukhari. And we know that Bukhari is written centuries after the death of Muhammad, over 200 years after his death. Be that as it may, Muslims deem Bukhari to be authentic without dispute. According to Bukhari, Ishmael married a woman from Jurhum. And then Abraham came to visit Ishmael and didn't find Ishmael at home and didn't like uh, this this wife of Ishmael so he made a comment and then she reported to Ishmael the comment that Abraham made Ishmael realized that Abraham told Ishmael to get rid of his wife so Ishmael divorced her this is according to the hadith literature Sahih Bukhari you'll find it there so then Ishmael found another woman from the tribe of Jurhum and married her and then again according to the same tradition Abraham again visited Ishmael again Ishmael wasn't home you would think that Abraham would stick around and wait for Ishmael to return he didn't he liked the second wife and pretty much told Ishmael to keep her. So as far as the Muslim sources are concerned, uh, Muhammad is a descendant of Ishmael by virtue of the fact that Ishmael settled in Mecca, married a woman from the tribe of Jurhum, and they became the ancestors of the Quraysh tribe from whom Muhammad sprung. So this is according to the Islamic tradition. If we go by the biblical tradition, we must accept, uh, I'm sorry, reject, let me correct myself, reject, the Islamic tradition because it conflicts with the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The Old Testament says Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran, not in Mecca. The Old Testament says that Ishmael's wife was an Egyptian, not from the tribe of Jurhum. Now again, someone will say, but see, your Bible's corrupt. The Muslim will say this. And we don't go by the Bible. We only accept those parts of the Bible that agree with the Quran and the authentic traditions attributed to Muhammad. However, you have a problem, Muslims, and here's the problem. If you recall, last night we had a discussion on the Quranic view of the Bible. We only gave some of the men, uh, pl uh, plenty of verses, some of the many verses from the Quran, which sh uh, shows that the author of the Quran and Muhammad believed that our Old, New Old Testament and New Testament were the revealed words of God. In fact, according to the Quran, Jesus confirmed the Torah in his possession, as did Muhammad. If you want references from the Quran, you can go to Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3. Verses 48 to 50. Surah Imran, chapter 3, verses 48 to 50, uh, specifically verse 50. Again, chapter 5, verse 46, Surah Al Ma'idah, chapter 5, verse 46. I want you to note these down and go back and read the Arabic, not just the English, to confirm what I'm about to say. And another reference, chapter 61, verse 6 of the Quran. Chapter 61, verse 6. And all of these passages, it says that Jesus confirmed the Torah between his hands. Confirm the Torah in his possession, the Torah that he had access to. Historically, we know what the Torah was in the possession of Christ, the Torah that Jesus was reading. Due to discoveries and manuscripts such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Old Testament that Jesus would have been reading and confirming to be the words of God is the very Old Testament that we read today. That's the Old Testament that says, Ishmael settled in the wilderness of Paran and married an Egyptian. So if the Quran is right, that Jesus confirmed the Torah, then that means the Old Testament that we currently read is the revealed words of God, because that's the Torah that Jesus confirmed. If that's the case, then the Hadiths are wrong, which say that Ishmael settled in Mecca and married a woman of the tribe of Jurhum. So I want you to understand the implication of that. If the Quran is right, Jesus confirmed the Torah, and the Torah he confirmed is virtually identical to what we read today. That Torah bears witness against the Hadith and its assertion that Ishmael went to Mecca and married a woman from the tribe of Jurhum. Because the Torah says he settled in the wilderness of Paran, that's not Mecca, and married an Egyptian. So you have absolutely no evidence that Ishmael and Abraham went to Mecca and built the Kaaba. There is no evidence from the Bible. The evidence from the Bible refutes this assertion. There is no pre-Islamic archaeological or historical documentation that says that Abraham and Ishmael settled there. You only have the testimony of one man, and this testimony comes from a source written over 200 years after his death. And you want us to reject the testimony of the Bible and believe the testimony of such sources. And so uh, what, what Sam has uh, given us is another Islamic dilemma. Yesterday, Sam gave us a, an Islamic dilemma. In our next program, we're going to see a, an Islamic dilemma. And he's given us one now, where either way you go, there's only two ways to go, and either way you go, you're in trouble. So... The Bible says that uh, that uh, 
the Bible tells us where Ishmael went, and it's very different from the Muslim picture. Uh, according to this, Abraham and Ishmael had nothing to do with the Kaaba in Mecca or with any of these, uh, with any of these places. So what we have is uh, if, if the Bible's right, if the Bible's right, then these are all pagan practices. None of them go back to Abraham. None of them go back to Ishmael. They're purely pagan practices. So if the Bible's right, as the Quran says it is, and don't forget Muhammad himself put his hand on a copy of the Torah and swore that it's the word of God. So if Muhammad's right that the Bible's the word of God, and if the Quran is right that the Bible's the word of God, then Islam is a collection of pagan practices because that's what the Bible says. On the other hand, if the Bible's been corrupted in what it says about Abraham and Ishmael and, 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 and what they did, if these are wrong, then the Bible isn't the word of God, in which case the Quran and Muhammad are wrong, and Islam is a false religion. So, notice, if the Bible's right, then Islam's a false religion because it's just a collection of pagan practices. Uh, but if the Bible's wrong, then Islam, once again, is false because uh, Muhammad and the Quran were wrong when it says the Bible's the word of God. Either way, Islam is false. Uh, how can you Muslims deal with this? We gave you a, a, uh, we gave you an argument like this yesterday. We gave you another argument today. We'll give you another argument uh, later on this evening. Over and over again, we see Muslims have only one of two directions they could go, and either one means that Islam is false. Thank you. Uh, let's take a break, and we'll be back. Uh, stay with us. Uh, welcome back again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we are uh, uh, the new edition of Jesus or Muhammad, and our title tonight, our topic, Pagan, the Pagan Origins of Islam, and uh, we talked uh, more than half an hour explaining our topic tonight, and uh, we are ready to receive your calls, 248-416-1300, and I think we have a call, George. Good evening, George. You're on the air. Go ahead. Good evening. Yes. Uh, God bless everybody. Thank you. Uh, what a coincidence, you know, you're talking about this subject, and uh, I'm reading a book by the name of the Sword of the Prophet of Islam by Serge Trifkovic. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in this book, they, he said <laughs> that Ishmael never went to Mecca. Exactly. Ishmael went only to Egypt. And he got married, and he got two sons. Uh, I don't know about two sons. He had 12 sons, but go ahead. I think uh, probably he got married the first time, and he got two sons. One of them, one of these two sons, anyway, it's not for sure, because this guy here, uh, he, t he went to the Middle East, and he tried to get as much information as he can. But one of these sons, he went to Mecca. Uh, the book I'm reading right now says that I was looking at that 490 after Jesus uh, there is a prince became the prince of Mecca his name Kusai Ibn Kalb and this guy here he became the prince of Mecca and he was uh, the chief tribe of Quraysh, and uh, it was Mecca, it was uh, the Kaaba over there, and he was as ritual every year before uh, they go to Al-Hajj, what they call, he was washing the Kaaba. And some sources, they said that the black stone, uh, probably some of the Arab tribes, they went to Damascus for trade, they brought that uh, black stone from an area which is south of Damascus. And if you go by yourself over there, you're not going to find nothing but black, uh, black rocks. So 
490 after Jesus. It was Kaaba. It was a tradition of Hajj over there. It was a Ramadan fasting. They used to fast for a whole month, you know, before Islam came. And as we know, Muhammad born 570, and he died 632. So 490 to, uh, to 570, it's about 70 years before Muhammad. Uh, there was fasting Ramadan, and there was doing the uh, paganism uh, tradition. So uh, I would like you to emphasize on this subject that whatever tradition the Islam mm -hmm. have, it's not from Islam uh, themselves. It's a tradition It was in the Arabia before Islam came. And thank you. Thank you. You want to comment on that or take the you next call? Come, you, okay, let me, I wanted to read some reference on the black mm -hmm. stone he just said. I had said earlier that these are pagan practices, and let me just elaborate. Uh, and these, these are things that even Muslims will admit, but what they will say is that these were practices instituted by Ishmael, and that the descendants of Ishmael then perverted these practices by worshipping other gods. In other words, they'll tell you, yes, the pagans before Muhammad ran around the Kaaba seven times. They would run between the hills of Safa and Marwa, uh, seven times. In fact, according to one tradition, Muhammad's companions hesitated to run between these two hills because initially they used to be two idols, and they would run between the two hills in honor of these idols. Uh, but Muhammad said, no, that's okay, you can keep that practice. And the justification is that these were practices instituted by Ishmael, as well as Abraham, that later on, throughout history, the descendants of Ishmael perverted. Uh, so they'll tell you, yeah, these practices, the pagans performed them. However, they were originally instituted by monotheists to worship the one true God, and these practices were uh, performed in honor of the one true God of Abraham. Like we said, and we're going to emphasize, in fact, we're going to sound like broken records, there is absolutely no biblical, historical, or archaeological proof. Specifically, there is no pre-Islamic proof that a Muslim can point to to show that Abraham Ishmael ever went to Mecca. Uh, but I just want to comment on... on uh, the things that Muhammad did, which prove that the God that sent him is not the same God that raised up Abraham and sent Moses with the law. This again comes uh, from an Islamic source. This comes from the history of Al-Tabari. Uh, history of Al-Tabari, which you can actually find in English. This comes from volume six. And he, he, he mentions an event that while Muhammad was in Mecca, after he claimed to be, to be a prophet of God, after he claimed that Gabriel came and commissioned him, he was running around the Kaaba and kissed the black stone. And I want to read that reference because this kissing of the black stone is sheer idolatry. It is proof that Muhammad was not worshipping the God of Abraham and that the God of Moses did not send Muhammad, had nothing to do with him. But let me read the reference. And I know I think we have other callers, but I think it's important I read this. This comes from the History of Al-Tabri, uh, volume 6, and uh, pages 98. And following. Uh, actually, it's pages 101 to 102. I apologize. Let me read this. Uh, Ibn Humayd, Salama, Muhammad bin Ishaq, Yahya bin Urwa, bin al Zubair, his father, Ur Urwa, and then Abdullah ibn Amr bin al As, I said to him, What was the worst attack you saw by Quraysh upon the Messenger of God when they openly showed their enmity to him? And this is from pages 101 all the way to 102. I just want to get my references straight. And if I'm mistaken, I do apologize. Our intention is not to give you uh, misinformation. He replied, I was with them when their uh, nobles assembled one day in the Hijr and discussed the messenger of God. They said, we have never seen the like of what we have uh, endured from this man. Now, these are the pagans complaining about the abuse of Muhammad. Muhammad constantly abusing them. We've never seen the like of what we have endured from this man. He has derided our traditional values abused our forefathers. This is Muhammad, by the way. And what's interesting, Dave, is yesterday we got calls from Muslims saying, you shouldn't be criticizing other religions. You shouldn't be attacking other religions. Just, you know, practice your religion, talk about your own. Here we have an Islamic reference saying that Muhammad constantly attacked, derided, insulted other people's beliefs and values. Look at the reference again. He has derided our traditional values, abused our forefathers, reviled our religion, caused division among us, and insulted our gods. We have endured a great deal from him, or words to that effect. While they were saying this, now note this, this part, the messenger of Allah suddenly appeared and walked up and kissed the black stone. 
Then he passed by them while performing the circumambulation. Notice at the time where the Kaaba still has 360 idols. There are still, under, still 360 idols surrounding it. Muhammad is running around kissing the black stone during the time where the Kaaba is still in the possession of the pagans. Now, how does this prove that he's not a prophet of the true God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jack, uh, Jacob, or Moses? Well, according to the scriptures, God expressly forbids. This is in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 5. Read it. Exodus 20, verses 1 to 5. God expressly forbid, forbids making an image of anything in heaven, on earth, in the seas below, bowing to it. In another reference, we see that bowing to an object and kissing it is worship. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 18 says that God will preserve 7,000 Israelites, has preserved 7,000 Israelites who have not bowed the knee to Baal and kissed, kissed him, meaning his image. So kissing an object, an image, is an act of worship. So the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Moses, expressly forbids his followers from making an image and kissing it and bowing to it. And yet here we have Muhammad, who is supposedly the prophet of monotheism, a prophet sent by the same God of Abraham, kissing a black stone at a time in which the Kaaba is still in the hands of the pagans, still surrounded with 360 idols, and yet Muslims want us to believe that he is a true prophet who comes and fulfills and completes the message of the prophets before him, uh, prophets like Moses, and so on and so forth. And it, it's, it's interesting, I mean, if you look at, like, the Old Testament prophets, many of them came during a time when Israel was compromising with paganism, and the purpose of God sending these prophets was to draw them out of that paganism back to the worship of the one true God. How, how can you say that Muhammad is in this same line? All of these prophets came to keep people away from paganism. Muhammad comes along and says, oh, all these pagan practices, that's okay. I'll just say they're all from Abraham, and that'll make all of these pagan practices okay. I mean, uh, a fake, a false prophet of the Old Testament could have done that. If a false prophet came along and said, oh, you're, you're performing all these practices, you're bowing down to Baal, no problem, Abraham did that too. Any, any, any false prophet could come along and say all these pagan practices are okay. And that would, uh, that would help him a lot with the pagans. Uh, but he's, I mean, think about it. Every single prophet in the line of the prophets of Israel called people away from paganism. Muhammad compromised with almost every aspect of paganism. In fact, I can't think of, of too many instances uh, ex uh, uh, practices or beliefs of the pagans that Muhammad didn't compromise with. You say, well, Muhammad was a diehard monotheist. He even compromised with that, as we'll see on the next program, yes. when we examine the satanic verses. Muhammad compromised with everything, with, every, with practically everything the pagans held. And this is a prophet like the Old Testament prophets? Come on, folks. All right, uh, we have another call from uh, Wissam. Good evening, Wissam. You're on the air. Go ahead. Wissam? Sam is with us. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 How are you? You're in the air. Go ahead. Oh. Uh, peace be with you. Um, Thank you. I just have a comment uh, regarding all the shows that you've uh, uh, been uh, airing like for a long time now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, I'm really impressed with what you're doing, like Brother Sam and uh, Brother uh, Dave. Uh, like... Um, this is amazing. Like um, I bow to all the effort that been, you've been doing, but the problem is, like, none of the 1,000.5 billion Muslims know that what you're talking about. They don't know that, you know. And um, I just don't know how you can get the message to them. I mean, you're doing a great effort, and I appreciate that. It's just a the problem is how to get uh, the, uh, the picture to these guys. And even sometimes I think that even if they get the picture or they see the picture, it, it seems like, you know, that Muhammad is their God. It's not Allah is their God. It's whatever Muhammad did, they do with effortless. Like it doesn't matter what it is. It's, it's, he's their idol, you know. It didn't matter if it's true or not. They just do it. You know, something else I just want to say is um, we will have to think about 
something else. I mean, uh, God bless you. Bless your show. It's amazing. It's awesome. Like I said, I don't know what it is. You might think about something else, but um, we have to have something else. We have to have another idea to bring um, these people to understand, like, where are they going or why are they thinking this way? Or is it, um, I, I have just an example, if you let me speak for a little bit longer. Um, we, like back home, if we tie a donkey uh, with the front hand and the, uh, uh, like uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, his leg, like for, uh, like for two weeks or three weeks, um, they would, uh, like, uh, and we'd take it off after three weeks, uh, the donkey would still think that he's still tied up, you know. <laughs> after we take it off, you know? And these people have been tied up for 1,400 years. I, I don't know, like, how, uh, like, in, a, in a one year or five years or ten years, how we can, uh, uh, like, make them, like, like uh, get this thing off of them. Um, anyway, uh, like, just to make a conversation, like, uh, uh, a little bit shorter, um, and uh, about like uh, peace and Islam, peace and Islam is uh, um, why is Christianity in the Middle East, in the in the Holy Land, is less than one percent right now. I need an answer for that. Second, you know, in Jordan, in Syria, in Turkey, in Iraq, in Egypt. Everywhere where Christianity was a dominant religion, and now they are less than, like I would say, five percent in these countries. Why is that? Is it because Islam was peaceful? And I need like an answer on that. Yeah. And on top of everything, in the Holy Land, like I said, it's less than one percent. There is churches in the Holy Land that it just exists in a town full of Muslims. Thank you very much, uh, Osam, for your uh, question. Uh, uh, let me take another call. Uh, who is with me? Next call, please. Uh, okay. My name is Vasily. Can you hear me? Uh, what's your name, please? Vasily. Vasily, how are you, Vasily? Uh, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for taking my call. You're uh, thank you, brothers, for your uh, program. I uh, are really glad to see you all the time. Uh, I am Ukrainian, and uh, I was born in a Christian family. But from the beginning, I was looking for the, for the truth myself. And I read many religions, and one of them was uh, Islam. And uh, I tried to re read a few times Quran, and that was really hard for me. I cannot see if there are any connections to logic and sense. And I, I had uh, many Muslim friends and I, I, I asked them for explanation. But none of them uh, can explain, explain me Quran. And until today when I see your program, I, I began to understand many things. Good. But I have mm -hmm. two questions. Okay. One about uh, <coughs> Muhammad. Uh, can you find did did uh, Muhammad uh, had prediction about his life, ministry, mission, everything like Jesus? Jesus was predicted from the beginning, very beginning. What about Muhammad? Uh, where he was predicted? Through him, through through whom, and for for whom? What what nation was waiting for him? And next, my question for the Allah. As I ask many times, Muslim, uh, Allah, Allah, one person, one, uh, one God, and He is just and He is merciful. But from my understanding, uh in one person cannot exist two natures. Justice and forgiveness cannot belong one person. Because uh, if 
you just to judge, you have to say Allah. How, how, how one person can, can say Allah and at the same time uh, bring forgiveness? That, that's really a mess. I cannot understand this. Can you explain for me how, how forgiveness and yeah. justice be in one person? For me, that looks like black and, and white. And that's really simple for a simple person. That cannot be, be in, in, one, in one person. Thank you very much. Can you Thank explain you. for me these two, two my questions? Yes. If Thank you. you. Wanna... All right. Yeah. Uh... We'll, we'll take these in reverse. We had two calls. Um, you, Allah is just and merciful. Uh, you, you, you said that th this is a problem. Well, I'd say it is for Islam, but I don't think it's, it's a problem for a being to have uh, an attribute of justice and an attribute of love and mercy, because according to Christianity, God has these attributes. We believe, but we believe that God is infinitely just and that God is infinitely loving and merciful. And how can these not be in conflict? Well, uh, we're going to look at this a bit uh, tomorrow when we discuss the, the reason for the incarnation. Uh, but a just being, uh, a being that is infinitely just, would have to punish all sin. Now, you're right in saying, uh, well, if a being has to punish sin, how can he also be merciful? Well, that is, that does seem to be a difficulty. If you're, you're saying there's a, there's a being who's infinitely just and infinitely loving and merciful, how can, how, how can he be both? If he forgives all sins, if he forgives people because he loves them, then he's not being just. On the other hand, if he punishes everyone for their sins, well, he's not being loving and merciful. And what we find is that if you claim that a God exists with those attributes, you have to have something like the incarnation and sacrificial death of the incarnate Lord. Why? Because if all sin must be punished, then at the end of time, all sin has to have been punished by God. All this sin must have been punished. But if that being truly loves people, he'll be, doing, he'll be willing to do anything uh, to forgive them. And what we find in Christianity is that God loved people so much that he willingly took the, pen took the penalty uh, upon himself. So what we have is that all sin for, in Christianity, at the end of time, every sin will be punished. If a person rejects God's love and forgiveness, then that person has to take the punishment himself. But for all of those who turn to God in repentance, God accepts that punishment on the Lord Jesus Christ. So all sin is punished, and yet God shows his infinite love and mercy by what he did for us. Now, we turn to Islam. Muslims also say that Allah is just and merciful. But in Islam, there's a conflict between them, and what we find is that there's a struggle between uh, Allah's justice and his mercy, and if you're a good Muslim, his, his mercy sort of trumps his justice. And so one of his attributes gets beaten by the other and then he can, uh, he can accept you into paradise. But what we also find in Islam is that Muslims reduce and diminish and insult God by saying that he's not infinite in his attributes. So think about Allah. According to Islam, at the end of time, has all sin been punished? No, Allah can just sweep your sin under the rug if he really likes you. Uh, so God is not all just because he does not punish all sin, but at the same time, Allah is not all loving and merciful either. Uh, over and over again in the Quran, we find Allah does not love the unbelievers. Allah does not love those who exceed the limits. All, Allah does not love the proud. Allah doesn't love all kinds of people. In fact, according to the Quran, Allah only loves good Muslims. Those are the only people that Allah loves. So what we find in, what we find in Christianity is that God, since because he is infinite, is also infinite in his characteristics and attributes. But in Islam... Uh, God's attributes are limited, so he's a little bit loving towards certain people, and he's a little bit uh, just because he punishes some sin. But this certainly isn't what we, uh, what we find in Christianity, so I don't think it's a problem for a being to be uh, infinitely just and infinitely merciful, provided you show how those attributes uh, are both exercised in history. Uh, you said, were there any predictions about Muhammad? I, I th uh, we talked a bit about this yesterday. There are predictions about Muhammad. According to the Bible, Jesus delivered, uh, delivered a message to his followers. This is the gospel. It's a message that Jesus died on the cross for sins, that he rose from the dead, and that he claimed to be divine. This is the core of the gospel, these three things. We're also told in the New Testament that false prophets are going to come, and they're going to try and corrupt and pervert and distort this message. Muhammad came along. 
And he seemed to agree with Christians on a lot of things. You Christians believe in God, so do I. You believe Jesus performed miracles, so do I. You believe Jesus was born of a virgin, so do I. You believe Jesus is the Messiah, so do I. There's only three things I want you to deny about Jesus. One, he didn't die on the cross. Uh, two, he didn't rise from the dead. And three, he didn't claim to be divine. Well, any Christian who knew anything about Christianity said, hey, we've been waiting for this. We were told this was going to happen. We've been waiting for you, Muhammad, because the Bible tells us that false prophets are going to come and are going to corrupt this message. Uh, so, one, the, certainly the Bible predicts the coming of false prophets who are going to corrupt the gospel. But second, Jesus tells us that we know a prophet by his fruits. We know a prophet by his fruits. We look at the fruits of just Muhammad and his life. Certainly seemed like a good guy for a while, but what do the, what, when, when the tree fully grows, what do we see from Muhammad? We see a man who's having sex with his slave girls and telling his followers it's okay uh, to rape people. He's enslaving all kinds of people. He's robbing people to support his religion. He's justifying almost every sin you can come up with, and he's proclaiming a heaven that is one big orgy for eternity. Uh, that's, that's what Muhammad came. Now, are these good fruits? Well, according to the Bible, certainly not. So, biblically, we're told that prophets would come along like Muhammad, and they're false prophets. Uh, one final prophecy, uh, Jesus said that false prophets come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Muhammad fulfills this prophecy about false prophets more perfectly than anyone else in all of history. How did Muhammad come when he was in Mecca? Peace, tolerance, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Let's all just get along. He came to the Jews and Christians. Hey, hey, I'm in the same line with you guys. I love you guys. You guys are great. When Muhammad became strong and powerful, all the pagans have to die if they don't convert to Islam. And the Christians and Jews, they have to be subjected and pay us if they just want to survive. What do we have? Come to you, he comes nice and pretending to be loving. As soon as he's in power, the sheep's clothing comes off. So Muhammad, over and over again, fulfills not any prophecies that a new prophet is coming to Arabia who's going to give some new uh, revelation. Muhammad fulfills the prophecies about false prophets who are going to come, corrupt the message, they're going to bear bad fruit, and they're going to be wolves in sheep's clothing. So, yes, there are prophecies about Muhammad, but certainly nothing that supports Islam. Thank you very much. Uh, we will have a break, and we'll be back. Stay with us, please. of Islam and uh, we are receiving calls. I have a call from Richard. Good evening, Richard. Go ahead. You're on air. May, may the peace of God be upon you and Thank you. people run away from your ways and God bless you for this show. Glory Thank to you. Jesus Christ, so our God will live. Uh, I heard about uh, uh, the Hajj. Uh, you know what Hajj? In yes. English, uh, uh, Pilgrimage. No, yes. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, is it is it an old day they said about it call it uh, was hack it means scratch a woman in old what days they want they got they, they want means pregnant. the truth what and did you say uh, richard we can't hear you richard richard uh, say it again i couldn't hear you you said hajj was called what um, uh, <laughs> In a moment, we couldn't hear you. Hajj was used to be called Mu. <laughs> okay, they used to say, because one of the Christian show I was watching, yeah. and the, the, uh, the presenter, he said about this subject particularly, I was stunned, and I, 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 I couldn't believe. And all days that women they used to go to Mecca in that particular stone, scratch themselves toward yeah. that stone in order to get pregnant. Well, to and receive a blessing, after yes. After that, mm. a man he came, and uh, you know what? And uh, uh, that's the presentative is Eliam Sipti Soda. Yeah, I, I yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, Maria to me, please, and God bless Lord you. Jesus bless you, Richard. Protect 
protect you from all <laughs> I mean, evil men. Thank yeah, you. Praise the Lord. My Lord bless you all. I was talking about that it was custom before the time of Muhammad for women to go to, be, uh, to the Kaaba, specifically to the Black Stone, and rub themselves against it, praying with the hopes that they get pregnant. Yes, and initially it was white, and it was over a period of years of being black, covered yeah. with... Uh, yeah, and interestingly, according to Islam, it was initially white and became black, and they say it became black because of people's sins. But uh, even according to non-Muslims, this stone was originally white, but it was because of women rubbing and people kissing and putting their mouths on it, women putting their vaginas on it to bless their, their pregnancy, um, yeah. that this, over a, period of, over a period of centuries of being covered with human uh, secretions, has just become black and, and tarnished, and this is what Muslims... Uh, long to kiss. They want to kiss this more than they want to kiss yeah. their own children. And uh, in fact, even in the Hadith, it records that one of the reasons why Muhammad forced uh, the pagans who had uh, been subjugated, forced the pagans to convert to Islam or be killed, is because he got sick and tired of them running naked around the Kaaba. This is actually from Bukhari and other sources, that after he had conquered Mecca and said they were free uh, to continue to observe their uh, pagan practices. A year later, Muhammad changed his mind and said, you know what? Either you become Muslims or uh, you're going to get killed. And part of the reason why is because they're running around uh, naked around the Kaaba and he got sick, sick and fed up with it. So yes, there is some truth to what you said, Richard, and the Lord bless you and watch over you and keep praying for us to be successful in speaking the truth for the glory of Jesus Christ. All right. I have uh, Martin. Good evening. You're on the air. Go ahead. Hey, how you guys doing? Doing Praise good. God. How are you? Excellent. I just want to start off by saying, God bless your ministry. God bless your methodology. You keep, you guys keep doing what you guys do. I, I definitely enjoy watching your show. Praise the Lord. Uh, I have, uh, you know, there's, there's a, something that I came across, and I was, somebody could explain it to me. That'd be great. The when when I talk to Muslims, they say Allah is just a, another name for God. But when you read the English translation of the Quran, you know they don't translate the word Allah into God. Now, is there, is there, why, why is it, why do they not do that? Okay. Is it because of the name of their God is Allah? Yeah, that is his name. I can give you what some of the uh, common Muslim apologists say. Uh, one of the assertions you're going to hear by Muslim apologists such as Jamal Badawi and even, um, <clears throat> Zay, uh, what's his name from India? The Zakir Muslim, Naik. Is that his name? Oh. Zakir Naik. Okay, I, get, I forget these apologists. There's so many of them. Again, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us the grace to speak truth and represent their views accurately. Uh, according to their assertion, Allah is a more appropriate name, not just because it is His name, this is His eternal name, that's what they'll tell you, but because unlike the English word God, they'll tell you this is their assertion. Now again, I'm going to refute that assertion and show this is wrong, and it's propaganda. Uh, it's because unlike the English word God, Allah cannot be pluralized, nor can it be feminized. Like the English word God can be gods or goddesses. You can actually read Zakir Naik in one of his articles on his website stating this, why Muslims feel more comfortable using the term Allah than, Engli uh, than the English word God is because of those reasons. Allah can't be pluralized. There is no plural. You don't say Allah's, and there is no feminine form of Allah. However, that's nonsense, and that's not true. There is a feminine form of Allah. It's Alat. Alat is the feminine form of Allah. And don't take my word for it. Read Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir's commentary on the Quran, which you can find online in a bridge form, translated in English, and you can read it for free. www.tafsir.com. T-A-F-S-I-R.com. There he give, goes into the origin of some of these terms. And he says that Allah is actually the feminine form of Allah. He even claims, and by the way, this is going to be significant because in the second program, mm -hmm. by the grace of the Lord Jesus, David Wood is going to be talking about the satanic verses. And the satanic verses uh, focuses on the daughters of Allah, Banat Allah, Alat al Uzza Manat. He even says that the word Uzza is the feminine form of Aziz, one of the names of Allah. Allah is called Al Aziz. So Al-Uzza is the feminine form of Al-Aziz. And Ibn Kathir also says that Manat, the other daughter of Allah, is the feminiz feminization of the name uh, Al-Manan, because one of the names of Allah is Manan. So yes, Allah can be feminized. It's Alad. In fact, there's also a plural form of Allah that appears in the Quran five times. 
The Quran five times calls Allah, Allahumma. Allahumma. There are Muslims who admit that Allahumma is actually the Arabic form of the Hebrew word Elohim. And anyone who knows Biblical Hebrew will tell you that Elohim is plural. However, just because it's plural doesn't mean it should be translated gods because it can be what is known as an intensive plural denoting that Yahweh has all the fullness of deity, right? But there is a plural form of Allah. It's Allahumma. It appears five times in the Quran. Allahumma. And there's a feminine form of Allah, Allah. So if Muslims tell you it cannot be feminized or pluralized, Either they're speaking in ignorance or they're trying to pull a fast one and deceive you. But the answer is that Muslims believe that Allah is his name. That's his eternal name. And it denotes that he alone is deity and he alone is worthy to be worshipped. But from the biblical per uh, perspective, according to the Old Testament revelation, God's covenant name, his personal name, the name by which he wants his adherents to know him, is Yahweh or Yahovah. And maybe, David, do you want to add something to this? Uh, yeah, I'll just add that this, this fits in perfectly what, with what we're saying. Uh, yes, the uh, people, even the pagans of Mecca during the time of Muhammad, believed in Allah. They believed in Allah uh, and a bunch of other uh, gods and goddesses. And what we find is that just as with everything else, whatever was true of 7th century pagan Arabia, that's what has to be true of Islam all around the world. Islam is an attempt to take 7th century Arabian culture and make it dominant over all the earth. But tell me, what does this have to do with worship of the one true God, especially when all these, all these practices and uh, many of these beliefs are simply pagan in origin, and you're, you're telling me that the one true religion, the one true remaining religion on the planet, is an attempt to take 7th century Arabian culture and make it dominant all over the earth? This, this doesn't make sense to me. Please, please uh, call us in and, and explain it. All right, we have a call from uh, Omar. Good evening, Omar. How are you, Omar? Hey, uh, hey, David, and uh, hey, uh, Sam, this is Omar. Uh, and I was looking at your program and I was hearing about, I'm a practicing Muslim, and I was hearing about what you were saying about our dear beloved prophet, Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. Yes. I think uh, I overheard, like, uh, from this program, I was getting through it, listening to it, is that you were saying that he's a sex maniac or some sort of person? No, no, like that? no, no, never, never said, said that. Never said it. He probably was listening to a well, different you, program. You keep, bashing, you keep bashing his personality that he loved women and that's all he was about was sex. Okay, here, Omar, 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 listen, we, we, we want to have a dialogue with you. We want to have a, we want to have a dialogue with you, so, but, but we'll, have to, we'll have to go back and forth. So let us just tell you what we have claimed and then you can, then you can respond to it. We don't say Muhammad was a sex maniac. What we say is that he told, so we're, we're looking at Islam from, we're not Muslims, we're not raised to believe that Muhammad is a prophet and whatever he did was okay. We're trying to evaluate him to see if whether he, whether he is someone that we should believe and trust as a messenger of God. And what we find when we examine Muhammad is that uh, he told his followers that they could only have four wives. So he tells all other Muslims, you can only have four wives, no more, no more. You can have one, two, three, four, or none, that's it. And yet we know from Muslim sources, from al-Bukhari, uh, from uh, all kinds of other sources, that Muhammad had at least nine wives at one time. So we look at this and we say, this is awfully suspicious. But, so this is a concern for us. We also look at uh, the fact that Muhammad was having sex with his slave girls. So Muhammad's having sex with his slave girls. He even impregnated one of them. We also find that uh, Muhammad... Uh, Muhammad's wives were offended and upset with him for sleeping with his slave girls when he should be sleeping with one of his nine wives. They objected to him, and Muhammad gave an oath, okay, I'll stop sleeping with my slave girls, and then he gets another revelation saying that uh, he can, have, he can ha go on continuing to have sex with his slave girl despite the fact that he made an oath to his wives. We find Muhammad walking in and seeing his, the wife of his own adopted son almost naked, and he walks out praising God because of what he's seen. And then Allah starts giving him revelations saying, you get this woman. We find Muhammad having sex with a nine-year-old girl. Uh, we find Muhammad in al-Bukhari telling one of his followers, Dia, hey, you go into that town of all the women captives we took, pick any one. And he picks, he picks a woman. And when Muhammad hears about her great beauty, he says, actually, she's for me. 
she's for me. If she's the most beautiful one, she's for me. You go pick someone else. So over and over again, we find some revelations that are very suspicious. We don't say, oh, he's a sex maniac and a pervert. But we, what we have to say is if we're evaluating whether we can trust this man, over and over and over again, we find very suspicious revelations that it, when, we consider the, the, you know, when we consider the revelations that we believe in, we don't believe in God as a person who uh, just wants to take his prophet and give him as, much, as many sexual partners as, as, as he wants. Uh, what we find in the Bible is that God calls his servants to a very high standard of morality. So what we're saying is it looks very suspicious that every time Muhammad has a desire, Allah gives him what he desires. And again, don't, don't say, hey, we're, we're, we're accusing Muhammad of this. If you're going to get angry at us for saying it looks like Muhammad is getting whatever he desires, you have to get mad at Aisha as well because Aisha herself noticed this. Aisha herself said... Uh, your Lord hastens to satisfy your desires, and that's that's what we're saying. But go ahead. Yeah, um, what I'm seeing on this TV show is that you're getting it one-sided. You know, there's a verb, a beautiful, there's a beautiful sentence in the Bible in Proverbs 16:16 16, 16, that says, "How much better to get wisdom than gold?" Right? The wisdom is, you know, what about Moses? How many wives? Did, how many of uh, Jethro's daughters did he marry? If you look at Abraham, only one. Abraham, wait, 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 you're cutting me off. You're giving it one-sided. I let you talk. Now let me Good. talk. Go ahead. Now let's talk about Abraham. Abraham married a slave girl. Abraham married Hagar. Okay, he had Hagar and Sarah, right? And Jacob. Jacob had how many wives did Jacob have? How many wives did David have? How many wives did Solomon have? You, you're giving it one-sided. Okay, all these prophets, all these men of God had more than one wife, and they had slave girls, okay? So if you're bashing Prophet Muhammad, you should look at the other prophets, okay? You're giving it one-sided, okay? And another thing... Omar, 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 one thing, uh, because you're going, you, you say one more thing, so you're going on to another topic. Let me just respond briefly, and then we'll give, you, we'll give you a chance to respond. You say we're only giving one side because we're not looking at the other prophets. Well, guess what? We never said... Muhammad had four wives, therefore we condemn him. That's not what we said at all. We said he told all of his followers as a revelation from God that you can only have four wives. And then he had more. That's what we're pointing at. Moral inconsistency. You do one thing and I get to do something else. You, all of you have to follow a rule, but I, God's greatest prophet, I don't have to follow that rule. You get a certain number of sexual partners, I get more. You get four, I get more. The, this is what looks awfully suspicious and if you don't see why it would look suspicious to us that the very man who is receiving the revelations is the one who happens to get more sexual partners than anyone else and that this man even though he tells his followers they have to keep their oaths in most situations if it's not to if it's if if, if they don't have a good reason for uh, rejecting it that this person who tells his followers they have to keep their oaths he gets to make an oath to his wives and then not follow it he gets to promise a specific woman to one of his followers and then take her because she's beautiful he gets to arrange in a marriage he gets to arrange a marriage with his adopted son and then take the woman if he wants that's what we're saying and you don't see that from Abraham you don't see that from David you don't see that from Moses you don't see that from, you don't see that in the Bible so we're not applying different standards it's Muhammad who applied different standards so if you're condemning us for applying different standards no we're applying one standard equally it's Muhammad who had different standards for other people and for himself but go on to your next point Okay, my next question is, okay, we're going to look at the whole history, okay? You're just starting at Muhammad, 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 Muhammad. Let's talk about the whole aspect, the totality of the circumstances, okay? The Gregorian calendar starts with the departure of Christ. As you know, obviously, as a Muslim, we do not believe he died on the cross. He rose to the heavens, okay? Now, let me get this straight. Muhammad came 570 <clears throat> years after the departure of Christ, right? In between then, right, the biggest empire on the face of the earth was the Roman Empire, right? Okay? It was a paganistic empire. They had goddesses and goddesses. They had Apollo. They had Nike. They had Africa. What happened? What happened? Hello? Hello? Did his phone die? They probably dropped the call. Omar, Omar, if, if you're watching, get on, a, get on a better phone and call right back. We want to we wanna hear this. Did, you, did we lose him? Yes, we lose him. Uh, Omar, 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 call back in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the phone booth. If, if Omar calls back, please move him to the uh, front of the line. Okay. All right. You want to comment on his, uh, that the Roman Empire was no, big in his Yeah, we, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't know <laughs> yeah, what his point know, was. So, what, what we do, what we, here's, uh, let me tell you what we, what we do know. Uh, he's uh, saying it, that you are claiming that uh, the 
uh, Arabic Peninsula where pagans are, also the Roman Empire was a pagan yeah, empire. See, see, now, now, now let's clarify. If you want to say that some uh, practice of some festival that or, or holiday that Christians practice, so let, let's say Christmas. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, lots of Christian Omar families back. will have uh, lots of Christian. Oh, okay. Well, let him. Is he on there? Omar, are you there? What, what, what are you talking about? If we wanted we to just cut you told off, you to call back we just and give you to... Okay, let me start when I started about the Roman Empire, okay? Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. What was the last thing that I said online? Because I don't know, because my TV was off. All, all we got to was uh, uh, Romans believed in different gods and goddesses. Okay, yes. So Constantine the Great was the first Roman emperor to accept Christianity, okay? But, you know, he, he did a lot of innovations, because you're, you're talking about a gap of 570 years from Jesus to Muhammad, okay? okay. You know, in the year 321, he changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday, okay? And no, no, that's not true. And thou shalt honor thy Sabbath in the Ten Commandments, okay? And Omar, you know, you're that's mistaken kind of there. Innovation that is in the Bible, in the New Testament, every time he keeps talking about the Sabbath, the Sabbath, the Sabbath. Yeah. Why does the Sabbath... As a Christian, why do you follow your religious day on Sunday? That's what my question is to you. You're talking about Muhammad did this, Muhammad did that. Let's talk about the history. Let's talk about the history. There's a 570 year gap between Muhammad, peace be upon him, yeah. and Jesus. Omar, you're can I comment? About that on that show. Do you want me to comment now? Uh, first of all, you're mistaken uh, when you said that Constantine changed Sabbath observance from Saturday to Sunday. There's actually writings that predate, uh, predate Constantine. You can actually look at the writings of. Uh, the church fathers and the apologists and they'll tell you that Sunday was adopted early on because that was the day in which Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and was victorious over the grave and death uh, but uh, I'm kinda surprised that you're saying that Sabbath is mentioned everywhere in the Old Testament and New Testament but somehow we Christians innovated and changed uh, Sabbath to Sunday but the Quran also mentions the Sabbath as an observance that Allah gave to the Israelites Beni Israel but then your prophet comes and changes it to Friday so by your same criterion, why don't you condemn Muhammad? And add to that that in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 50, this is your own Quran. And I'm not quoting it because I believe the Quran is revelation. You're a Muslim, you believe it, and I'm trying to use your own argumentation against Christianity, against you and your beliefs. In Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 50, it says that one of the functions of Jesus Christ, according to the Quran, which you believe, is that not only did he come to confirm the Torah in his possession, but he came to make lawful that which was forbidden to the children of Israel. That's in chapter 3, verse 50 of the Quran. And when you go and read the commentaries, the Mufassirin, the Muslim expositors, they explain that to mean that some things that were forbidden in the Torah of Moses, Jesus came and made it lawful. So then, by your criterion, why are you still a Muslim when Muhammad changed many of the laws that Allah gave to Musa? And not only that, but according to your Quran, Allah sent Jesus to also change some of the laws of Musa. So then why are you a Muslim and why do you believe in the Quran? And I'll just add that even, even in the Bible we find Christians meeting on Sunday. And this is because, the, the, well, because <clears throat> Jesus rose from the dead on Sunday. Uh, but also because the early Christian community was a Jewish community. So they would meet, uh, they would meet on the Sabbath. Uh, but then as a Christian, as a specifically Christian community, they would meet on Sunday, wh which they called uh, which they called the Lord's Day. So this doesn't come from any innovation of Constantine. If you want to learn about Christianity, I would suggest not going to bad uh, websites uh, to learn your information. We don't do that. What we learn about Islam, we learn from the Quran, we learn from the Hadith, we learn from the Tafsir, we learn uh, from the Sira literature, we learn it from your sources. We don't just go to a bunch of horrible websites and just regurgitate whatever we read there. Uh, but, but continue if you're still on the line. I'm still on the line, definitely. So let me get this straight, okay. To Moses was revealed the Old Testament. To Jesus was revealed the New Testament. Now my question is, God updates his book, obviously, so humans could implement and substantiate their lives in following the laws. Because at the time of Adam, what, brother and sister, it was permissible for them to get married. So obviously, you're talking about, it's been 2,000 plus years since the departure of Christ. And you're telling me there's, there, give me one prophet or one, man of God that has come. You know what I mean? There's the Gospel of Barnabas, the Gospel of Thomas. Why aren't they included yeah. in the New Testament? Okay. The New Testament <laughs> is composed of the Old Testament, which has Exodus, and then the Gospel of Matthew, Luke, John, and Mark. 
Now, why isn't the Gospel of Thomas and Barnabas not included? Okay, in well, it? here, let, let us, uh, Omar, Omar, let, let us answer. Let us answer, and then we'll let, and then we'll let you continue. Uh, you bring up the Old Testament and New Testament. You said the the New Testament uh, was given to Jesus. This is this is not correct, and it's not correct to say that the Old Testament was given to Moses. The Torah was given to Moses, um, but other books of the old of the Old Testament were given uh, to various uh, to various prophets and kings and so on. Uh, the New Testament was not given to Jesus. There was no book that was given to Jesus. Jesus was given. Uh, Jesus delivered teachings to his followers. His followers recorded these teachings. But in the New Testament, we have Gospels, which contain uh, are about the life of Jesus from people who are actually there, not from people who came 600 years later and didn't speak the language and had no clue what Jesus did, but eyewitnesses who are actually there or people who, who gathered information from eyewitnesses. Uh, and you have letters of Paul. You have various types of uh, books in the New Testament. Um, but what we find, you're, you're absolutely correct that God... Uh, gives what we could call progressive revelation. We would refer to covenants. Uh, God, uh, throughout, throughout history, has made particular agreements with particular groups. So God makes a covenant with Adam. That's an agree A covenant is an agreement. It's you do this, Adam, and I will do this. We're making an agreement, and you have to live up to your end, and I'm going to live up to my end because, you know, the Lord will live up to his end uh, of the covenant. So there's a covenant with Adam. There's a covenant with Noah. There's a covenant with Abraham. There's a covenant with Moses. Uh, but all through the Old Testament, we're told that a final covenant is coming. There will be a final covenant that God will, that God will deliver. And we're, we're given... Uh, examples of what this final covenant is going to include. In Isaiah 9-6, we're told that God is going to enter into his creation. In Isaiah 53, we're told that someone is going to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. And what we find is that in the New Testament, this is the fulfillment of God's prediction of a final covenant, a final agreement that is coming. And this is the covenant that is meant for all people. And this is the covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross for sins, rose from the dead, proving that he is the fulfillment of these prophecies, and he claimed to be the divine Son of God. So this is, according to the Old Testament and according to the New Testament, this is God's final revelation for mankind. So this is the message that people in, in the world today are supposed to follow. What we are supposed to do is not, hey, we need another revelation. We are now entrusted with God's revelation to bring that to people, which is what we're doing here, which is what, we, uh, what we're doing around the world. We are delivering God's final message to mankind. Now, if someone wants to come along and say, here, I'm bringing another revelation, uh, we, have to we have to examine this very carefully to see if it conflicts and alters God's final revelation given in the New Testament. So if a prophet comes along who, con who contradicts the teachings of Jesus, for instance, Muhammad says Jesus didn't die on the cross, he didn't rise from the dead, and he never claimed to be divine, we look at that and say, wait a minute, this conflicts with the teachings of the Old Testament because we're told in the Old Testament that God was going to enter uh, enter into his creation, that he, was going, that he was going to die on the cross and rise from the dead. We're told that in the Old Testament. We're told when it happened in the New Testament, and then Muhammad comes along centuries later and says, no, it never happened. Well, unless you give us an extremely good reason to believe in Muhammad, we have to reject him as a false prophet. But every time we go to the evidence, we find that Muhammad can't be a prophet. We, find, all we, ever find, we never find any reason to believe in Muhammad. All we find are reasons to reject Muhammad. So we reject Muhammad because... Uh, he disagrees with the New Testament. He disagrees uh, with the clear teachings of Jesus. Uh, we reject Muhammad because he received all of these self-serving revelations, revelations that have no purpose other than satisfying his desires. We reject him because he delivers the satanic verses, which, as we'll see in the next program, specifically identifies him as a false prophet. According to the Bible, we reject him because uh, we, we have prophecies in the New Testament of what false prophets are going to be like. We have a ton of reasons for rejecting Muhammad. We have no reason to accept Muhammad. So if you want us to accept Muhammad as a prophet, give us your best evidence. Give us your best reason for accepting Muhammad as a prophet. Omar, are you there? Yeah, I'm still here. So let me start with this, okay? Moses, okay? Moses, he took the children of Israel from Egypt and took them out through the Red Sea, okay? Immediately after the Red Sea, what? What did the children of Israel do? They built... They made, they made a cow, a heifer, out of gold, and they started worshiping it. And what is this? These are the type of people Moses and Jesus dealt with. They dealt with the children of Israel. 
they were people. Omar, 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 we'll, we'll let you continue. I just want to, I just, Omar, 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 I just want to clarify one thing and then I'll let you continue. One, yes, the people did tend towards, uh, did try uh, to worship the golden calf. Did God allow this or did God immediately correct them so that his true revelation would be preserved? The, the fact is God immediately rebuked them. And every time, every time throughout the history of the Old Testament that people turned to paganism and idolatry, God sent them prophets and sent them punishment in order to correct them. In other words, God didn't allow them to continue in their rebellion. We get to the New Testament and God g delivers a revelation, we'd expect the same pattern, namely God preserves it, and then Muslims today say, no, it's all been corrupted. Well, that's not what we know about God. We would agree with the Quranic revelation that, that uh, with what we find in the Quran, that which you believe as revelation, that God, that no one can change God's words. So we do not believe God is going to allow his people to persist in paganism and idolatry. Uh, so just to clarify, uh, yes, people did, did try to veer off into paganism, but God stopped them. And the, what we're showing on this program is that Islam veers off all the way, wholehearted acceptance of paganism. And Muslims just think it's okay because Muhammad did it. But go ahead and continue your point. Yeah, I'm, I'm a practicing Muslim. I'm practicing, you know, thanks to Allah, I am a practicing Muslim. Jesus came and dealed with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. What the Pharisees and Sadducees did is they were very, they were all about money and they, they made God seem like an all-hating person. They made God seem like that. Now, God, Jesus came to let them know he's all-loving, all-caring, okay? So he was the last prophet. We believe he was the last prophet in the line of Judea. That's why Muhammad came from the other side. He came in the land of Arabia with there's just, just, just. There's so much. There's so much miracles involved with Prophet Muhammad that it's so funny how you're bashing him. You know, Islam is 1.7 billion. It's strong. No matter how much you put the show on, it's gonna grow. It's the fastest growing religion in the world. In okay, America. Okay, hold on, Omar. We gotta go to a break. Omar, hold stay, the phone. Stay on the line. Stay we gotta go line. to a break. Don't leave. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll have a break and we'll, we'll, we will be back. Uh, we're back, and uh, we'll uh, go to Omar and David. Uh, Omar, uh, j just just to clarify something you just said, you you you, you pointed out that there are 1.7 uh, billion Muslims in the world, and that Islam is the fastest growing religion. We addressed this on the show yesterday. One, there, there's there's not 1.7 billion, but if you're comfortable with that number, that's fine. Why is Islam growing fast? And it's the, the the actual reason, if you look at the statistics, is that many Muslim countries are third world countries, which are uh, part. Uh, Part of the, the criterion for being a third world country is high birth rates. We find in, uh, even here in the West, in, in Europe, for instance, that Muslim birth rates are three times higher than that of non-Muslims. So it's not because people are converting to Islam around the world. Uh, people are converting to Islam, that's true, but that's not where you're getting this massive increase in Islam. It's, it's because of your birth rates, uh, because many Muslim countries are third world countries. But now you just said, because remember a few minutes ago, I said... Uh, why? Give us a reason. So we, we, we have all of this evidence against Muhammad. We find all of these problems with Muhammad. We never see any reason to believe in Muhammad. You actually gave us an argument. You didn't, you didn't clarify it, so I'm hoping you'll clarify it. You gave us an argument that Muhammad was a prophet. You said there are so many miracles associated with Muhammad, but you didn't give us an example. So could you give us some examples of what you mean by Muhammad performing miracles? Because if you can show us that Muhammad performed miracles, then we'll have to take that into consideration. So uh, what do you mean when you say that, because you keep changing the subject, we, you make a point and then I, I address it and refute it, and then you move on to something else. But let's, let's get on this issue of miracles. Uh, what miracles uh, show that Muhammad was a true prophet? Okay. Uh, the, the last person the Jews accept is Ezra, right? The last person the Christians accept is Jesus. And the last person the Muslims accept is Muhammad, peace be upon him, okay? Now, when Nebuchadnezzar burnt the temples in Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, right? This is history we're talking about. I'm not making this up. This is from my understanding of doing research. Nebuchadnezzar burned down the temples and all the Torahs were burnt, okay? Now, uh, the no. Old Testament. Uh, and no. who was the one who oh, memorized it? It was Ezra. So then they started claiming that oh. Ezra was the son of God. Okay, Jesus. Hey, uh, uh, you know. Omar, Omar, uh, we, we, yeah. we, we have spent, we've, we spent <laughs> many years studying Christianity. Uh, we have no clue what you're talking about right now. Could you please give yeah. us some sources for, let me for just what you're saying? Omar, let me Good. comment real quickly. Uh, you're getting these sources not from Jewish history because you said Nebuchadnezzar burnt all the copies of the Torah. That's refuted by the Old Testament. Read the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar is in the very palace of the king of Babylon, and he ministered during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar all the way until the Persians took over. In Daniel chapter 9, if you read verses 1 to 3, you're going to see that Daniel has scrolls of the prophetic books. One of those books include the Torah of Moses, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, and verses 11 and 13. He mentions the scroll of Jeremiah and the prophecy that Jeremiah made that the Jews would be in captivity for 70 years. And then he mentions all the curses falling upon the Israelites as recorded in the law of Moses, which means that he has a copy of the law of Moses and he's reading it. So this myth that you're quoting from doesn't come from accurate, authentic history, nor does it come from the Old Testament writings. It comes from myths and fables that were written centuries afterwards. He, he, he also said uh, uh, the Jews called Ezra the son of God. Yeah, that's from the Quran. So you made two points, but again, Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 to 3, I'm giving you the sources. Daniel is ministering to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, in the king's palace. You can read it, Daniel, just read the book. Daniel 9, verses 1 to 3, and verses 11 and 13, he makes reference to the law of Moses as well as the book of Jeremiah or the scroll of Jeremiah. And in Daniel 9, it's written after the Persians have conquered and defeated the Babylonians. So how could you say Nebuchadnezzar burnt all the copies of the Torah when Daniel has a copy of a to uh, the Torah in Babylon as he's ministering during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar all the way till the reigns of the Persian kings? I don't, I don't look, get it. I'm not a scholar. You're thinking, I'm, look, I'm only 19 years old and I'm doing my research. Good. Fine. Praise God. Okay, well, no, we're, praise God. We, 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 we're glad, we're glad, we're, Omar, mm -hmm. we're, we're glad, we're glad you're praise studying you. this. Most, most young people are not, are not studying this or taking God it seriously. Yes. So uh, we're glad you're doing that. Uh, but go ahead. Yes. We're not yeah. knocking you, yeah, by the way. I'm not a scholar. You're trying to like, I'm, uh, you know what I mean? Like the beautiful verse in Proverbs, it says, how much better to get wisdom than gold. Amen. This is wisdom. Wisdom seeking truth and, and finding it. We and agree. We agree. And I don't deny nothing. And you know what? You keep cutting me off. You keep cutting me off. Omar, 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 we cut, we cut, we, we have to, we have to cut you off if you say something false. We're not going, the, the purpose of this show is to get the truth out about Amen. Christianity and about Islam. If someone, whether Christian or Muslim, says something false about Christianity or Islam, we want to cut that person off so we can correct it. Otherwise, you'll just keep talking as if you've, as if you've established some truth. So as long as you don't say something false, then we, we, we won't jump in on you. But as we've seen, you, you, haven't, you haven't really gone more than 30 or 40 seconds without saying something that is uh, uh, false, obviously false. And Omar, with all due respect, uh, we can't just let you bring up 10 points. Uh, we have to deal with one point at a time. So bring up one specific point, make your case for it so we can address it. And, and, and I've, I've specifically asked if you, you, you made a claim, you made a claim. We, we want to examine the truth on this show. You made a claim that there are so many miracles yeah. associated with Muhammad. Uh, I'm asking you for one. Now, if you can give two or three very quickly, that would be, that would be even better. But what would be your best example of a miracle whatever, of whatever sort a miracle associated with Muhammad, because all we ever find is evidence against Muhammad. We never find any reason to believe in Muhammad. Give us your best example. It's the Quran. It is the Quran. It is the Quran. And you can bash it all you want. Well, the truth will prevail. Just like Moses, when he threw the stick, it turned into a snake. Just like, just like, just like Jesus, he healed the blind, healed the sick, brought the dead back to life. All prophets had miracles. Solomon was able, able to bend metal. He was able to bend iron. They all had miracles. And the last and Can the I, final miracle is the Quran. And you believe, Quran. Omar, uh, don't cut him off. I don't want to lose him. Omar, since you believe the Quran is a miracle, you believe everything is, it says is true and that whatever it says will happen shall happen, right? You agree with that, right? Is he on? 64 years after Christ, yeah. the great fire of Rome happened. And what happened? It was blamed Omar. on Christians. They took the 
Okay. Omar, we don't want to have to cut you off. If you're not going to listen, you're getting emotional, we're going to have to cut it off. You said the Quran is a miracle, therefore you believe whatever the Quran says will happen, must happen. That's, I'm, I'm correct to assume that. Well, if you, if you were watching last night's program, and I can't go back because we're dealing with another subject, according to your Quran, it says the followers of Christ would prevail from the time of Christ's ascension till the day of resurrection. Chapter 3, verse 55 of the Quran. Chapter 61, verse 14 says, Allah promised Jesus that his followers, from the time Jesus was taken to heaven, would dominate and be uppermost till the day of resurrection. And 61, 14 shows that Allah actually gave power to the believers in Jesus to overcome the disbelievers. So if the Quran is true, then Jesus' followers prevailed and will continue to do so <clears throat> till the day of resurrection. That means two things. Number one, if they prevailed, then that means their teachings, their message also prevailed because it makes absolutely no sense to say Jesus' followers prevailed, but his message got lost. Other, how can you be a follower of Christ if you're not following his teachings? So if that's true, where is that message of Jesus' followers? Where is the message of those who prevailed and will continue to do so till the day of resurrection, if not the New Testament? So, Omar, do you agree with the Quran? And if so, do you accept the implications of the statement of the Quran that the message and the followers of Christ have prevailed, will continue to prevail, the conclusion being that the New Testament must be that message because the New Testament is, is the documents that was written by those who were given victory and the New Testament message is prevailing and spreading like wildfire all over the world till this day. Do you accept that conclusion? I accept whatever the Quran says. I accept Jesus. Excellent. If I never, if I don't accept Jesus, I am not a Muslim. You know. So do you accept the New Testament? Testament? You're talking about now about Islam is this and Islam is that and the prophets this. Sixty-four years after Christ, the great fire of Rome happened. Okay, and Nero, the emperor Nero, who did he blame it on? He the Christians, yes. Because the Christians, you know what it is? Because they were the, the Christians of those times were believing in the Tawheed and the oneness of the one God. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, uh, no, Omar, Omar, no, can you okay. give us can you give us any source saying that these Christians uh, saying that the Christians that Nero wanted to persecute uh, believed in no, Tawheed? He, can you give us a source? Any Quran, source yeah. other than some horrible website where you're usually getting your information from? Because I'll tell you right now, you're not getting any pretty much anything you've said. You're not getting any of it from uh, any scholarly resource. I know I know you said you're not a scholar, but uh, whatever your level of learning, you have to go to accurate, uh, accurate sources. Think about this. If I just go to what I find about Islam on some random website, you'd, I, I would come away with a really bad view of Islam. If I'm just going to believe what I find on some random website criticizing Islam, I'm going to come away with some very bad things about Muhammad. I've seen things about Muhammad being homosexual. I don't believe he was, but I've seen things about Muhammad being gay and having homosexual yes, affairs and all kinds of things on the internet. Do I believe them just because I read them on the internet? No. We have to go to reliable sources. Now, uh, we, 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 have to, we have to go on to, to, to other callers, but I'll just ask you uh, one more time. Uh, you've said that the Quran is a miracle. I've asked for, what I'm asking for is evidence, not some blind claim. Now, what's the difference between you saying the Quran is a miracle or me saying, no, the Bible's a miracle or me saying this bottle of water is a miracle? What's the difference here? What is it that makes this book miraculous? Is it because it accurately predicts the future the way the Bible does? Is it because uh, it's prophesied in earlier books the way the New Testament was, the way the New Covenant was? Is it because it's accurate on science? Is it because uh, of its literary style? What is it? Give us, give us something very specific here, some piece of evidence that shows that this book is a miracle. It hasn't been altered or changed. It has, the, you may say it has seven different scripts, seven different dialects. It's recited in seven different ways, okay? But it has not been changed. It has not been altered. When King James translated it from Aramaic Greek to uh, English, he said the Lord vested the power in me to change it from Greek Aramaic. Wait, 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 wait. Who, who said this? Oh, Omar, who said this? King James. The King James. Uh, could, could, could you give us a source on that? Yeah. Sh show, us, show us, show us, show us. Come on. Show us. No, tell us. Tell us. Because, again, we, 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 no one says this. This Bible right here came, it's based on manuscripts that came long before King James. So if this Bible is translated from manuscripts earlier than King James, 
uh, a thousand years, more than a thousand years before King James. How could King James have, have influenced this? It's impossible unless you believe King James had a time machine and went back more than a thousand years before his time, then there's no way he could have influenced these manuscripts. Do you not see how absurd your claims are? Uh, Omar, your Quran says that your Quran was being corrupted in the lifetime of Muhammad. 1591. Surat al-Hijr, chapter 15, verses 90-91. Here I have the Quran. I'm holding it up so you know that I'm not just quoting out of thin air. Surat al-Hijr, chapter 15, verses 90-91. to 91. As we sent down on those who divided, as have made the Quran into shreds. So your Quran itself testifies that in the lifetime of Muhammad, uh, the Quran was being corrupted. Uh, it was being uh, tampered with. And then you have hadiths that record passages that are missing and chapters that are missing. Uh, some missing. But see, again... We're going off topic, now we're talking about the preser preservation of the Quran. Yeah. But notice, Omar. notice, notice, uh, because I, I, I want to clarify this, because Umar says, Umar says that, he is, that he is studying. But notice, for those of you who are watching around the world, almost everything Umar has said has been false, whether he's talking about Christianity or whether he's talking about Islam. He said that, that Muhammad is known for many miracles. I said, well, what's your best one? He said, the Quran. I said, okay, what's your best reason for believing that the Quran is miraculous? He said, it's perfect preservation. Sam pointed out that according to the, the Quran, Surah 1591, the Quran was being changed during Muhammad's lifetime. But if that's not enough, now let me just go through briefly here because Omar, Omar, Notice what, what we're doing here. You have a belief that is based on what you've heard about Islam. We can show you, because we go to your actual sources and we do careful historical investigation, we can show you that that claim is false based on what your own sources teach. Now, let me go through this very briefly. Uh, Ibn Abi Dawud, this is, this is the son of Abu Dawud, of Sunan Abu Dawud. And what does he say about the Quran? He says, many of the passages of the Quran that were sent, uh, that were known by those who died on the day of Yamama, uh, but they were not known by those who survived them, nor were they written down, nor had Abu Bakr, Umar, or Uthman by that time collected the Quran, nor were they found with even one person after them. Here he's referring to an instant where Abu Bakr sent many of the, all of the people who had the Quran memorized, he sent them into battle thinking that Allah would protect them so that he wouldn't allow his Quran to be corrupted. And these people were slaughtered, and he specifically says many passages were lost on that day, and they weren't known by anyone else. Now, if we go through, and if you, if you want to call back, uh, you can. But what we find when we examine the evidence, according to your sources, according to your most reliable sources, uh, Muhammad's top scholars of the Quran didn't agree on what chapters were supposed to be on the Quran. You said it's never been changed. Muhammad himself identified his greatest teacher of the Quran, as Abdullah ibn Masud. Abdullah ibn Masud had 111 chapters in his Quran. He said that Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 are not supposed to be in this Quran. How can you say it hasn't been changed? In uh, Sahih Muslim, in Sahih Muslim, one of your most trusted collections of Ahadith, we're told that two surahs came up missing. Two entire surahs came up missing, and he says that it was because of the hardness of their heart. This is Abu Musa. This is Abu Musa saying this, that they, they forgot parts of the Quran because of their hardness of hearts. They didn't recite it enough. Over and over again, we find Aisha saying that two-thirds of Surah 33 are gone. They forgot them. He couldn't... Uh, 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 Uthman couldn't locate them when he's trying to put together the Quran. Two-thirds of Surah 33 are missing. Aisha even said that the verse of stoning and the verse of breastfeeding an adult ten times, when we read the Hadith, these verses were revealed as part of the Quran. They're supposed to be in there. What happened to them? Aisha tells us in Sunan Ibn Majah that she left it. She was the only one who had a copy of them. She left it lying on her bed, and a sheep came in and ate the manuscript. This is not me saying this. This is not, uh, this is not some bad website saying this. This is Sunan Ibn Majah, one of the collections of Sahih Sitta. Over and over and over again, like a beating drum from the Quran, from, the, from, from all of your collections of Ahadith, we find over and over again that the Quran has been changed, altered, corrupted, Parts of it have been lost. Parts of it that aren't supposed to be in there were added in. And you say, perfect preservation. Why? Because your imam told you to believe that. Your parents told you to believe that. And you've never, in your investigations, actually gone to the evidence to see whether your belief is true. We're telling you that it's not true. And if you look at the evidence, you will see what you've been taught is not true. And Umar, I'll just ask, if they, if they deceived you about that, if they convinced you that the Quran has been perfectly preserved, when all of the evidence from all your sources say it has, what else have you been deceived about, my friend? Pastor Jules, can you remind uh, them what the uh, topic is as you go to the next uh, the, call? Just the, so they can know. the pagan of 
uh, the pagan origins. origins of Islam. That's so, our topic. And uh, Omar, yes. uh, thank you very much uh, for your time. And uh, I will take the next call. Yes, hopefully we stay on topic. Please stay on topic. The pagan, uh, the, or, uh, the, the pagan origins of Islam. Yes. Good evening. You're on the air. Go ahead. Blessings in the name of Jesus. Amen. Glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and I hope Omar gets to see the light and he keeps Amen. studying. In Jesus' God bless name. Him. He's trying. Amen. Um, Sam, Sam, I have a question for you, okay? For me or for David? Um, for both. Okay. okay, David, either way, either way. Uh, where does the custom of Muhammad sleeping with his dead aunt come from? Now, my understanding is it, it has to have some kind of pagan origin for, for uh, and, and I haven't been able to uh, do a good study on the pagan origins and the time uh, in the area of Muhammad. So if you could give me some kind of a, a background on it, I would appreciate that. Uh, it, I, I'm not sure exactly. What, are, are you referring to uh, Muhammad sleeping with, with Ali's mother, dead yes. mother? Yeah, uh, that, that yeah. well, as far as the narrative, this comes from uh, a collection called Kans al-Umal. Uh, but basically, for those of you who aren't familiar with the, with the story, uh, it says Muhammad uh, went down into Ali's mother's grave and slept with her. Um, uh, as far as this having a pagan origin or not, I don't know. I think, I mean, I, I, think, it's, I think it's horrible. Uh, if this really happened, I think this is, is absolutely disgusting. But I think I understand uh, Muhammad's reasoning so uh, Ali's mother dies they think oh maybe she's going to hell maybe she didn't have a, a correct belief what and Ali is horribly distraught and horrified what's hap what's going to happen to my mother it seems to me that Muhammad's reasoning is well if I sleep with her then she'll be one of my wives she'll be identified as one of my wives and this will make her okay in the afterlife so I don't know if this was uh, specifically a pagan practice it seems to be based on Muhammad's belief that anyone he has sex with is going to be you know is going to have a better uh, afterlife or something like that so lessen the torment in the grave yeah lessen lessen the torment, torment the of, of the grave um, but yeah that's that's about yeah, all I can say so, on that so do you want me to read the narration sister do you want me to read the narration are you there out of all of yeah I'm here do you want so to, me to read the narration or what do you want you want to move on uh, no, let, let me ask you this first, and then read the narration. Okay. So out of the 360 gods, idols, that yeah. Muhammad Smith, you don't know if one of them was a god of the dead or something like that, that would influence him to think that this was an okay practice to do? Uh, no, we, won't, we don't know. There, we're the 360 idols were not given all their names. The most famous of the, okay. of the pagan gods would be the daughters of Allah, Banat Allah. Alat al Uzamanat and David Wood in the second program at 10:30 p.m. Lord Jesus willing will be discussing the daughters of Allah, Banat Allah, Alat al Uzamanat, and the significance it has on the prophethood of Muhammad, and how he comes under the condemnation of the God of Moses. So we we do know of some of the gods because the Quran does mention these goddesses, and there are narrations that mention Muhammad's lapse into idolatry and praising the daughters of Allah, but. I don't know of any record, it may be there, but I don't know of any record that mentions the names of all 360 idols or their significance. Okay, so that's one thing I'm trying to do research on is all of the pagan customs and worships and of idolatry in Muhammad's time, so just to let you know. Um, one more question. The Friday worship, is that also a pagan custom? I heard you mentioning it with Omar very briefly. Could, could you touch on that for me? Yeah, what I mentioned was that his argument was that uh, Constantine changed Sabbath observance, something that Yahweh commanded Moses and the Israelites, and Constantine changed it to Sunday. Sabbath is supposed to be Saturday or Friday evening because the Jews, their day start when sunset, so it's from evening to evening. Uh, and that Constantine changed it to Sunday observance. And I said, well, if that's the case, the Quran also says that Sabbath was uh, uh, instituted for the children of Israel that Allah commanded Musa, Moses, to tell the Israelites uh, to observe Sabbath. In fact, there is a reference to the Quran that some of the Jews who violated the Sabbath, Allah turned them into apes. So uh, my point was that if you have a problem with Christians worshiping on Sunday, because the Old Testament says that the day of worship is Sabbath, 
then be consistent and condemn Muhammad because Muhammad acknowledges that Sabbath was instituted by God through Moses, but he went ahead and instituted Friday instead of Sabbath. That was my point. Now, as far as the pagans uh, congregating on Friday, yes, according to the Muslim sources, uh, the pagans would congregate on Friday long before Muhammad adopted it into his religion and as part of his practice. So, yes, there is evidence the pagans did it as well. Do you by any chance have a surah or a quote on that, that they were doing that in, uh, original? Yeah, you have to just that. look at, get the, the seerah on Muhammad, the biography of Muhammad, and go into the pa practices and the observances of the pagans, what they were doing before Muhammad, and what Muhammad was doing before he was called to prophethood, quote-unquote, and the fact that even the Ramadan itself, this fast month that Muslims observe, was a month of fasting for the pagans, and the proof of it is, that when the Spirit came to Muhammad and told him he was a messenger of Allah, this happened when Muhammad was himself observing Ramadan before he was called to become a prophet of Allah. So you can find this in the Sirah as well as the Hadith. Thank you, sir. And one more question. I heard you guys say that Muhammad had said that uh, it, well, he, he had more than one wife, which I know. No uh, he had more than four wives, which we know. I think he had 17, if I'm correct. Is it fair to say that some of his immediate apostles or followers also had more than four wives? Yes, they did. Time? Not four wives, no. They had four wives and uh, concubines. No Muslim besides Muhammad could have more than four wives at the same time. But what his followers would do would divorce some and marry others so that they kept the number at four at all times. And, and, it, and they were specifically commanded if, if someone who had six or eight wives became a Muslim, Muhammad commanded them, you have to get rid of all your wives but four. So pick the ones you like least and get rid of them. Uh, and uh, the interesting thing is that this, this only applied to everyone else besides Muhammad. Muhammad had the special right to have as many wives as he wanted, in addition to all his sex slaves. Yeah. Well, thank you, sister. Lord bless you, and uh, Lord use you mightily right. for his glory. We, we have, have another call? Uh, take a break, and yes. then we'll get to the rest of the calls. Uh, stay with us. Break, and we'll be back. Uh, welcome back, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our topic, the pagan origins of Islam. Please stay to the topic. And we have some calls. I will take uh, Jamila. Good evening. You are on the air. Go ahead. Well, yeah. Um, what is the whole point of the show? We are discussing the pagan origins of Islam. Or are you, are you talking about the show in general or of this particular episode? This one. This, this, particular ep this particular episode of the show, uh, we're talking about the pagan origins of Islam, namely that, that Muslims point to everyone else and say, ah, everything has been corrupted by paganism, and yet when we look at the practices and many of the beliefs of Muslims, we see a direct connection with paganism. For instance, Muslims fast during the month of Ramadan. This was a pagan. This was a pagan practice before the time of Muhammad. Uh, Muslims take the Hajj to Mecca. This was a pagan practice before the time of Muhammad. Muslims circle the Kaaba seven times. This was a pagan practice before the time of Muhammad. Muslims kiss the black stone. This was a pagan practice before the time of Muhammad. All five of the prayer times that Muslims have were held by a group called the Sabaeans before the time of Muhammad. These were, these were, these were pagans. The beliefs about heaven and the, the, the Huris, the, the sex slaves that Muslim men will get in heaven, these were, these were the beliefs of the pagan Persians. Almost everything we find in Islam, as far as practices are concerned, uh, is derived from paganism. So that's what we're discussing during the show. All right. Um, if you, are you trying to like, prove us wrong or something? Uh, Islam? Yes, absolutely. We definitely want to show that Islam is false. Okay, is that changing anybody's mind? Is that going to convert anybody? 
Uh, no, I, my, 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 my goal, I mean, I mean, people do convert. My, my, my best friend is a convert from Islam. I know several people who have left Islam based on the fact that Muhammad is a false prophet and based on the outstanding evidence we have for Christianity. Uh, but my concern, just, just to clarify, my concern is not so much converting people away from Islam as keeping people from converting to Islam because I'm convinced if people, if the world becomes aware of the facts about Muhammad, about the pagan origins, about the, uh, some of the abominable practices of Muhammad, that no one will ever convert to Islam unless a sword is put to their neck. Uh, so that's my view, but go ahead. Um, okay, are you trying to like, I don't know, are you trying to convert people? Because people aren't going to convert for whatever the heck you're trying to say. It really doesn't matter. Uh, well, I, I, I have to agree with you. I don't know where you're getting the claim that people won't convert based on learning about uh, Muhammad. Uh, Zachariah, Zachariah Boutros is doing what, what, exactly what we're doing right now, except he's been doing it for, for much longer. And thousands of people, thousands of Muslims have left Islam based on learning the facts about Islam. Again, I know many people, I know many people who have left Islam. One of the one of the one of the hosts, one of the, the one of our standard hosts here, uh, Pastor Joe, is a former Muslim. So over and over and over again, we see people leaving Islam, and it's usually people who study Islam and learn what it actually teaches, and then they're horrified at what it actually teaches. And people who turn to Christianity and realize, since Jesus rose from the dead, his message has to be from God. You go ahead. Um, my my dad would like to say something. Sure, okay. sure, sure. No problem. Please. Okay, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, please. Sir, are you there? Okay. Hello? Uh, never mind. Um, okay. So, so y'all made this show, like, just to contrast. All right, go ahead. I, did you make this whole show, this whole, like, TV, did you make it all, like, to just contrast between Christians and Muslims? Yes, yes, yes. Th yes the, the purpose of the show, that's why it's called Jesus or Muhammad, and that's because when you examine the teachings of Muhammad and you examine the teachings of Jesus, you find that they are irreconcilable. They cannot, be, they cannot both be teaching the truth from God because according to Jesus, he came into the world to die on the cross for sins, rise from the dead, and he is the incarnate Lord. He is, he is, he is the divine Son of God. Muhammad denied all of this, and that means they can't both be speaking the truth. One of them has to be wrong. And so the purpose of this show is for all people around the world, whoever is interested in learning the truth, uh, we are presenting the facts to them. We are presenting the facts about Islam, the facts about the Quran, the facts about Muhammad, as well as the facts about the Bible, the facts about Jesus. Uh, we are presenting the facts about both religions so that people, instead of just believing what they're taught to believe, instead of just believing what their parents tell them or what their mosque or their church tells them, we want people to base their beliefs upon the evidence. And so we present the evidence for that. We can't control people, what they're going to do with the evidence, but we want to make sure that people know the evidence because what we find so often, as in the case with Omar, if you were watching, you saw Omar, almost everything he believed about Christianity and almost everything he believed about Islam was totally wrong. Not wrong from our opinion, factually wrong. We can point to sources documenting that he's wrong. For instance, when he said the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Well, according to all of his Muslim sources, the Quran hasn't been perfectly preserved. So the purpose of this show is to present people with facts and information so that they can make the correct conclusion rather than just believing uh, what they're taught to believe. Okay, um, there's no difference between Jesus because Muslims, first of all, they do believe in Jesus. And they do believe in his cause. Well, uh, I, I have to disagree because when we, when we go back historically, again, not just whatever we want to believe about Jesus, when we go to his followers and what they claimed that he said, we find that Jesus claimed to be the divine son of God. So he is not just some random person. He is the, he is the incarnate Lord. He is Lord. Uh, he is the divine son of God. That's what, Jesus can, uh, that's what Jesus said about himself, and this is why people wanted him killed. So this Jesus said he is going to die on the cross for sins, he's going to be the sacrifice for sins, and that he's going to rise from the dead. Then he rose from the dead, proving that what he said about himself is true. Now we turn to Muhammad, and Muhammad said, no, that never happened, and Muslims say, ah, we believe in Jesus. No, you don't. That's like me saying, I believe in Muhammad. I don't believe what you believe about Muhammad. I, I believe he was a false prophet. I believe he did all kinds of things that I cannot 
uh, I cannot uh, consent to as a Christian. I believe that he, he, was, he existed. I believe that he was a person. Does this mean that I believe in Muhammad? No, I, I, don't, believe, I don't believe in Muhammad. Similarly, uh, Muslims believe in, not in the true Jesus, not in the Jesus that actually came into the world. Muslims believe in a Jesus who spoke in the cradle, which the true Jesus never did. They believe in a Jesus who never died on the cross, uh, which the true Jesus did. Uh, they believe in a Jesus who never claimed to be divine. That's something that Jesus, the real Jesus, did. And so when you claim that you believe in Jesus, you're not believing in the true Jesus. You're believing in a fictional, mythological Jesus uh, that Muhammad preached. Now, what we want to do on this show is show you what you believe about Jesus is false. We want you to believe in the true Jesus, not some false Jesus that you've been presented with. But go ahead. Okay, um, you want us to believe in the real Jesus and leave Islam. And leave Muhammad. Is that what you're trying to say? Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, is this taking place in America? What's that? What about America? Is this, America? Is this, is this taking place in America? Yes. Taking I, place um, in, in Muslim countries and Canada. I believe in freedom of speech, speech, but you, you should give respect. We should, we should give respect? Yes, you should really give respect. We, we, we are. We're, we're, we're speaking respectfully right now. What do you mean? Are you saying that we shouldn't try and show other people that their beliefs are false? No, whenever you so, so ju just to, just you, just said, wait, you just said mystical, mystical beliefs. Mm -hmm. That's not respect. Okay, well, uh, I have to disagree with you, but listen, uh, assuming what you're saying is true, you're saying that it's wrong to criticize people for their beliefs. I would encourage you to read Surah 9, verse 30. In fact, I'll include uh, the verse before it after I read 30. Uh, verse 30 of chapter 9 of the Quran says, And the Jews say, Uzair is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, The Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. May Allah destroy them. Destroy who? Destroy the Jews and the Christians because of our beliefs, how they are turned away. In fact, the verse just before this, uh, Surah 929 commands Muslims to fight Jews and Christians because we reject the religion of truth, which it claims is Islam. If you go to Surah 517, it says that any Christian who affirms the deity of Christ is an unbeliever. If you affirm that Jesus is divine, you are an unbeliever. So according to the Quran, I am not a believer in the truth. And we go to Surah 98.6, which says that anyone...